And we'll go ahead and get started for today. Good morning. Uh, this is Monday, June 8th, first day of uh, online summer anatomy and physiology. It should be interesting. Like I said, if you have not taken the attendance quiz, please make sure you do that. The access code for that is boot. That is your way of showing me uh, that you are present. And if you don't take it, you're not here, then you're going to get the boot. So uh, make sure you do that. Uh, it is just the first day, but we have a ton to cover today. Uh, we are going to do a brief introduction to the class. Uh, again, hopefully uh, the class has been open for a week, so hopefully most of you had a chance to look around and do some of the things, but there are some key concepts that I wanna make sure we cover, including uh, some of the key highlights of the syllabus. And look at some, look of, our at some, online, of, look at some of our online resources. And then also then we will start our lecture today primarily talking about anatomical terminology. And then we will also start our lab information by talking about organs and organ systems. Uh, so that is gonna be the game plan for today. Uh, as you can see, as you've looked around, there is a lot of material that is due in these first couple days. So some of it is some housekeeping stuff that has to be done and some of it is just to, because we have to hit the ground rolling. Uh, there is a student info sheet that is due today by 4 p.m. Uh, that is your way of giving me information about yourself or asking questions about the class. It helps me to tailor it to this class. So that is something that's important to get done so that we can talk about that tomorrow. Although I have had a chance to look at some of them and I do want to mention some of the things that I saw from those as we go through it. Uh, this class has a chemistry prerequisite. So uh, today at uh, one o'clock after class has ended, uh, there is going to be a 20 point chemistry quiz that will open up. Again, I, this is a prerequisite for the class, so I don't wanna have to remind you what an acid and a base is or what a covalent bond is or those types of things. That is information you should have coming into this class. So this is a way of encouraging you to remember that information. If it's been a while since you've taken chemistry, what I would encourage you to do is in your, um, in your uh, uh, textbook, chapter two, where it talks about chemistry, I would encourage you to read everything up to macromolecules. Uh, the macromolecules are the interesting things. Those are the things we're gonna be talking about. So basically everything up to there is uh, what you're responsible for. And I will warn you right now, uh, this chemistry quiz is actually not my quiz. I actually went to one of the chemistry instructors on uh, campus and said, hey, uh, give me 20 questions that you think a person who successfully completed your class should be able to answer. And so these are her questions, uh, but again, it's just uh, uh, an encouragement to help you to uh, remember your chemistry as we move forward. Uh, as far as housekeeping stuff, there are a couple important things. One is your lab safety form. Uh, again, this was something that was dropped on me a couple days ago from our dean. Even though we are all safely, comfortably at home, uh, since this is a lab class, we are technically required to have lab safety forms. I guess if I'm having you, I don't know, take your own heart rate and you injure yourself or something like that, I guess the school doesn't want to be liable. I, honestly, I have no idea why we're doing it. Uh, but it is required. Uh, it is a lab safety form that has to be completed. And if you do not complete it, unfortunately, you cannot take the class. So make sure you fill it out. Uh, one of the important things of the lab safety, and I think I talk about it on the form itself, is there are basically three places to fill in information. The top is your information, the bottom is your signature, and then the middle, about two thirds of the way down, is actually where your um, uh, emergency contact person is. So that's the emergency contact information. So not your information, but your emergency contact person. So please fill that out. Those are due by the beginning of class tomorrow. Also, again, to take the exams, you are required to use the Proctorio Proctoring Service, which uses the microphone and the cameras uh, that many of you are showing and using right now. So make sure you have that set up and set up properly. I have a Proctorio Compatibility and Syllabus Quiz. Uh, it is a, a quiz where you can take, uh, has a few questions on it, and really the point of it is to make sure that your Proctorio is working properly. In fact, I would encourage you to do that before you do the chemistry quiz, because the chemistry quiz is worth uh, 20 points, whereas the Proctorio quiz and syllabus quiz is only worth 10. So work out the kinks on the cheaper one, and then uh, make sure everything's set up and proper for your chemistry quiz. A very small handful of you have had the opportunity to meet with me uh, five, uh, for five, meet with me for five minutes online and get five points of extra credit just because we're not gonna have a lot of interaction the same way we would in the classroom walking around. 
Um, and so uh, this is going to be uh, challenging. And so one of the things to encourage uh, more interaction I've done is this five for five Zoom meeting. Uh, come and meet with me for five minutes, uh, introduce yourself, ask any questions that you have, and you'll get five points of extra credit. That is also due uh, by the uh, beginning of class tomorrow. Um, this is going, so after class today, I will be available and I'll be available most of the day so that uh, I can make those arrangements so we can meet on Zoom. So you can do that. Uh, there may be a couple more of these, some opportunities to touch base with students uh, later on in the semester as well. And so this will be the first one. Uh, so I encourage you to take advantage of that to maximize your points because that's really what this class is about. And then one of the big resources we're going to be using is our uh, modified mastery in A and P. And there's it's a simple four point assignment. Again, we're going to probably finish this class with somewhere around 1,200 points. So four points probably isn't going to make or break your grade, uh, but it is um, it is important that you get on there and start looking at the resources. And we'll do some of that stuff today. At so make sure you do that, and that's due by uh, the end of the day tomorrow. So I will remind you about that tomorrow as well. We keep going. One of the other uh, lab simulators we're going to be using is Labster. And so the first Labster assignment is going to be due on Thursday at the beginning of class. Again, all assignments are due at the beginning of class. Um, and uh, so that's going to be due then. Uh, you have to complete that activity. You have to complete it 100% of the activity. And I think you have to get a score of 80% or better on it to get credit for it, uh, to get full credit uh, for it. Uh, and then also the other thing that we're going to be doing is working with a lab manual. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But your first lab manual assignment is also due on Thursday as well. And uh, so we'll talk about that when we talk about the syllabus. So again, a bunch more people have shown up. Uh, when you come on in the morning, this is what it's going to look like. I will have what our game plan for the day is going to be. I will have the assignments that are coming up uh, set up there that you're going to, any other announcements. If there is a daily quiz like there is today with the attendance quiz, uh, the access code will be there for you so that you can get on and do that as well. So again, if you have not done your attendance quiz, uh, minimize your Zoom, go back to Canvas and do that. It's just one quick question. It's your way of showing me that you're here and that you're present. And the access code for that is boot. All right. Any questions on any of that? Excellent. That's what I love. A stunned silence. Perfect. Excellent. All right. So uh, what we are going to do now, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this and switch to our um, syllabus or really our Canvas site is what I want to share with us now. Uh, do, do, do. So that is here. Excellent. All right. So again, you have a syllabus quiz, so you should um, have already taken a look at this or be right prepared to look at this. And so I'm not going to read the whole thing step by step, but I do want to talk a little bit about, like I said, our Canvas site, starting first here with the syllabus site. Yes, it has the syllabus. It has a copy you can uh, download uh, from this as well and all of the information, uh, including, for instance, like our student learning outcomes. Uh, if you ever have trouble sleeping at night, I would encourage you to come here and read these. This is our goal for both 430 and 431. This is a two semester class. Uh, one of the things that I really want to talk about right now here first is our uh, class materials because uh, there's been a lot of questions on this and I wanna make sure everybody understands uh, what they are responsible for. The real key to this class is there are really three main resources uh, that are needed for this class. Uh, and there are several ways to obtain those. The first of these is our textbook, All right? So we have a textbook bundle uh, that you are responsible for. Really the key to this is you need the two things from this. The first thing that you need is a textbook. The textbook for this class is the Marib Human Anatomy and Physiology 11th edition. That is the textbook. However, if you have a 10th edition, if maybe you try to take this at CRC and they use the Martini book or something like that, you are welcome to use that as well. I don't care which textbook you use. However, what I will say is that I mostly teach to this textbook. 
what I mean by that is I try to parallel the book at least a little bit. So for instance, if there is a physiological process that your textbook describes in seven steps, I'm going to pretty much describe it in seven steps as well. However, the Martini textbook, because Martini wants to sell his textbooks as well, may uh, describe that same process in eight steps. Now, when it comes to the quiz, do I care whether you have seven steps or eight steps? This is the part where you guys respond. Do I care if you have seven or eight steps? No. No, absolutely not. All I care about is whether or not you have the information. You could describe it in 14 steps for all I care, as long as all the information is there. However, for some students, having me lecture to you in seven steps and then going and reading it in eight steps can be confusing. So again, whatever you're comfortable with, you must have a textbook, all right? There are two bundles that will allow you to actually get the textbook. I only have one of them here because at the time when I was writing the syllabus, uh, the bookstore was still transitioning. Uh, but if you go to the bookstore, and I think they're using a, a, a company called Follett, I believe, or something like that, is the company that it is, go to the ARC bookstore, uh, and they will take you there. Uh, what they have is two textbook bundles. One actually has the physical copy of the textbook, uh, plus, a histo uh, pardon me, plus a photographic atlas, uh, plus an applications manual, and then your web resource for the modified master and AP and access code that gives you not only free access to the modified master and AP, but also a free electronic version of the textbook. So that textbook bundle basically comes with the real textbook, the electronic version of the textbook, and then two other resources. Now the applications manual is not something we're going to be using in this class. It's something they throw in free for the bundle, but a lot of people, especially those who are looking to getting into nursing or EMTs or things along those lines, it provides a lot of practical examples, a lot of clinical examples that can sometimes really help people to understand these concepts. So I think it is a good study tool, but there aren't any assignments from it. Uh, so like I said, if you have another textbook, that's fine. Uh, the e-textbook bundle, which you see here, comes with those three uh, same resources, uh, the modified mastering a and with the electronic version of the textbook. It also has the AMP applications manual and then um, uh, the uh, photographic atlas. Uh, so it has all of those things as well. But you have a third way of getting these materials as well, or at least some of them. From our Canvas site, if you go to the modified mastering a and you will get two free weeks of the mastering a and and it can be purchased there as well. And you can purchase it one of two ways. You can purchase it without uh, the textbook, which is I think $70, something like that, $69, $70. Or you can get it with the electronic version of the textbook for like $115. So any of those three ways will get you the modified master in A&P and a textbook. The only problem with buying it through the Canvas site is you don't get a photographic atlas. Again, this is our first time doing A&P online. I know we did half of a semester of it last uh, semester. Uh, but the, for the beginning of the class is the first time, and, and this is going to be a challenge. Uh, you have to realize you are going to be learning the bones without ever holding a bone in your hand. You're going to be learning a muscle without ever holding the muscle models in your hand. So having a really good photographic atlas that does a really good job of showing you the pictures and showing you the bone features is something that is going to be really, really important in this class. Yes, your textbook has it, less your modified master in A&P has it, your lab manual has it, all those things have these resources, but the more ways you have to look at this stuff, the better it's going to be, the easier it's going to be for you to master it. So I strongly encourage you to get a photographic atlas if you get the just the electronic uh, master in A&P access that way. The second thing you're going to need, though, is going to be a, or I guess the third, the third thing you're going to need, because we need a textbook, we need the modified master in A&P, and the third thing we need is the lab manual. Now, mine is bound, this is the teacher's edition, and it is bound. The student version, if you get a physical copy, is actually loose leaf, which is nice. One of the things I love about this lab manual is it is like a workbook. So it is much more interactive than most of the other lab manuals that I have worked with. Professor, is this uh, version? That's it right there, exactly. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, and so it's, it, it has uh, workbook aspects to it, which I really, really like, I really enjoy. Uh, and you're gonna be turning those in for grades. Now the reviews for that, now that's not the same thing that you just showed me, is it? Okay. Yeah, that's not the same thing as what you showed me. This is not the same thing as what uh, okay, the okay. one that you I know, I know, I know that one. Okay. okay. Um, those reviews have two parts to it. Uh, that's one of the things I like. Every unit has a review and the reviews have two parts. The first part is a check your recall, whereas where you're basically just regurgitating information. Uh, you know, you learn something, you throw it on the page. But the second part of it is a check your understanding. And that one is more critical thinking type questions. I really like those questions. It really helps you to think about the material. And often those uh, check your recall, uh, pardon me, check your understanding questions will sometimes show up as essay questions on the exam. So it is important to do that, do both parts of it. And with that lab manual, what I'm looking for is effort and time. Homework basically in this class is free points. As long as you put your time and effort into it, you are going to get full credit. Right? Most homework assignments I am grading for completeness, not for correctness. Right? There is no reason you should get something wrong. You have your textbook, you have your lab manual, you have the almighty Google. So you should be able to come up with the correct answers for these things. But as long as you're putting time and effort into it, I'm not going to mark you wrong. You're, let me rephrase that. You're not going to lose points if you get something wrong. All right. There will be a few assignments that we will do that will be graded for correctness. And I'll always warn you about those ahead of time. But most homework assignments, I'm looking for time and effort. So as long as you put time and effort and you get it wrong, you're still going to get full credit. If you leave an answer blank, or if a question says A and B and explain, and you just say A, that doesn't show time, that doesn't show effort, and that you will lose points for. So you won't lose points for getting it incorrect, you will lose points for not putting time and effort into your homework assignments. And there are a large number of homework assignments in that lab manual. Now again, you can get a physical copy, uh, it can be gotten through Amazon. It can be gotten through the bookstore. The nice thing about the bookstore is it is bundled with a histology atlas. This histology atlas, even though you're never going to hold a microscope in your hand, we are going to look at a tremendous amount of microscopy slides, especially when we're doing tissues, especially when we're doing skin, especially when we're doing the nervous system. We're going to look at a lot of histology. We're going to be looking at a lot of slides. And so for a lot of students, it's the least intuitive thing we do. So having a good photographic histology atlas is something that's really important. Because again, you have a lot of resources. Your textbook's got some. Your lab manual has some. The, the modified mastering A&P has some, but it doesn't have a lot. So usually what you do is what most people do. When you need something, you go to the almighty Google. The problem with Google is Google is too powerful, right? I'm sure like you, you wake up every morning and the first thing you do is say hi to Google in the morning. And like me, you do your first web search. And my first web search is usually Justin Bieber shirtless, right? Just to see what new tattoos he's gotten this week. Now, if I type that into a Google search, is every single picture that I'm gonna get actually going to be Justin Bieber shirtless? Anybody wanna try it to make sure? No. No, it's not, right? The good news is I know what he looks like, so I can tell the ones that are really him and not him. The problem is if you type in a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue into a Google search and get a hundred pictures or a thousand pictures or a million pictures that show up, if you're not familiar with what a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue is, then you're not going to know which ones are actual ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissues and which ones are not. So having an atlas where you can actually look at that tissue and understand that tissue, and then once you understand it, you can go to the Google and you can see lots of different examples about it. So having a good histology atlas is also something that is gonna really help you to be successful in this class. All right. Question? Yes. Um, so these resources, are these going to be the same resources used for 431? Yes. <laughs> so here's what I will say. Um, if for every single instructor on campus, we all use the exact same textbook. 
So as long as you take 431 at American River College, you will be using the same textbook, you'll be using the same modified master in A&P, you'll be using all of those same resources the same. What I will say is only about half of the instructors use this particular lab manual. There are a couple that use some of the other ones. Uh, so there is, it's not quite as much of a consensus on that. So the lab manual would be the only thing that would be slightly different but the textbook part is definitely something uh, that you can get. Now, again, you can purchase this, the physical copy, take pictures of them, fill them out, do it that way. The other way you can get them is you can rent them from Vital Source and Chegg. Now, I am much more familiar with Chegg. I have had students use Chegg in the past, for the past probably two years, to rent uh, the lab manual. And they don't, I haven't had any problems, any students have problems with printing limits on how many pages they could print out. Uh, so uh, I don't know as much about Vital Source. I think their printing limits are somewhat different. So I don't know if you'd run into problems with that uh, for their downloading and them. Now for those, you can either print them out, fill them out, take pictures and turn them in, or you can uh, complete them online and turn them in that way. But uh, you are gonna be turning these assignments in as graded assignments. Uh, so again, you need that. And like I said, the first one is Thursday. So uh, we want to get started on that. Okay. Okay. Thank Great you. Great question. Any others? I have a question, Professor. Yes. Yes. Um, are all the student learning outcomes uh, like across the board for all Los Rios colleges? Like if I were to take A&P, the second A&P at CRC, like would I be prepared with your class? And vice versa? Yes. Uh, 430 and 431 across uh, uh, the whole Los Rios school district is the same class. So yes, so the things that I teach you should, I should prepare, uh, my goal is to prepare you to take anybody's 431 class. Now, the only thing that I would say with that is different schools may use different resources. Uh, so they may use a different textbook as well as a different lab manual. Uh, but yes, all the material that I teach you will help you to be successful in any 431 class at any Los Rios school. Okay, thank you. Yep, great questions. And, and again, this is, this is another important thing that I should mention. As you see, I tend to talk fast, uh, and this is without caffeine. I haven't caffeinated yet this morning, so you should see me with caffeine. It's really, really bad. Uh, and uh, so I strongly encourage you to uh, take the opportunity to ask questions. I am a strong believer that the only bad question is the question not asked. Uh, again, if you are confused by something, I guarantee someone else in the class is confused by it as well. So be the one that's brave enough to raise your hand or to speak out and ask that question, right? And again, here we have it even nicer. If you're embarrassed and don't want to raise your hand, you can use the chat window to ask a question that way. Um, and so you, with the participation, you can raise your hand in the participation thing or give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or something like that or if you have questions. So you have that opportunity. So I strongly encourage uh, interaction with this. That way I know people are out there. I know we're having this conversation and that's going to be a good thing. All right. Uh, the last obvious thing that is required for this class is going to be, where's my, there it is. Obviously, uh, web camera and microphone. Again, the Proctorio is going to be the monitoring system we are going to use for all the lab, all the lecture exams, and the final exam. Uh, you have to be proctored for this. Uh, I know from talking to a couple students, it does seem a little invasive, and it is a little invasive. Uh, but this is the nature of the online format. If we are going to maintain the integrity of the class, we need to maintain the integrity of the test taking process. Uh, and I want to talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, so you'd have to have a webcam, you have to have a microphone, you have to have it set up properly uh, to be able to take those exams. All right. So those are the things that are necessary. Questions on any of that? I had a question. Yeah. So we're going to need um, the photographic atlas and anatomy, physiology, and the photographic atlas of histology, both of those? So this photographic atlas, and let me see if I have one here. Yeah. So this photographic atlas is the gross anatomy. So what this is, is things like, you know, the muscles or the bones or things along those lines. So that's what the, uh, the photographic atlas is. Whereas the histology atlas 
is microscope slides. So one of the, so the histology atlas is for your microscope slides. This is for the microscope work. Uh, the photographic atlas is the one that, for instance, when we're learning, uh, perfect. When you're learning the bones and bone features, you have a picture of the bones, you have a list of what the bone features are, and these are the things that you're gonna be responsible for on the exam. So being able to recognize and identify those things. Uh, like I said, your textbook, your, your lab manual, uh, even the master name P will have some of those things, but the more resources you have to help you to be successful, the better. And so these histology at the, and the photographic, these atlases uh, are really beneficial for learning the material. Like I said, one of the huge challenges you guys are gonna have is you're not gonna get that hands-on experience. Right? You're never gonna get a chance this semester to feel a bone in your hand. Uh, and that makes it more challenging to learn it. And so the more ways you have to really look at it and understand it, the better off you're going to be. Okay. All right. Hi, Professor. Can I use this uh, version? No, that is not the same. Oh, for the Atlas, yes, yes. For an Atlas, yeah. Yeah, yeah it doesn't have, it doesn't have to, neither, it doesn't have to be either of these two particular Atlases. These just happen to be the ones that are in the bundles and the advantage of the bundles is they're, by bundling them together, they're less expensive. But if you have, if you already have another atlas or something like that, you're welcome to use that. Okay. Yeah, if you're a huge Grey's Anatomy fan and uh, you grabbed an atlas because you like the show, yeah, that's fine too. Whatever, whatever can be fancy. As long as you have one of those resources, that's what I care about. All right. Okay. Excellent. All right. Uh, mouse. All right, uh, next thing I wanted to talk about is the course evaluation. Again, there are going to be both lab and lecture exams and you're going to take them on the same days. Uh, again, just to avoid confusion, one of the things because of the way the proctorio system works, technically these are uh, under the quizzes on, the, uh, on Canvas, so that's where you're going to find those. These have to be completed. They can be completed in either order that you want. You can take the lab first or the lecture first, but they must be completed during the class time. Uh, so from eight o'clock in the morning till 1235, these will be available, but that is the only time they're gonna be available. So again, if you start your lab exam at noon, you're only gonna have 35 minutes to complete it. And I can promise you that's not enough time. All right, they are going to use the Proctorio system. Uh, and again, there is that Proctorio uh, uh, and uh, protocols um, uh, quiz for you to take. I haven't had a chance to see everybody's yet, but there are a couple of key things that I want to point out. Uh, most of you are getting uh, the three things that you can lose points for wrong uh, and also doing it wrong as well. Uh, one of the three things, one of the most important things you need to do during that quiz is to show your workspace. When you are doing the scan, I'm not interested in right, seeing what's on your ceiling or seeing what's on your bookshelves. What I care about is what is on your workspace, right? There should not be papers on your workspace. There should not be other electronic devices or other computers that are turned on or things along those lines. You need to scan your workspace. I have to see what's on your workspace because the problem is that while you think you like to look down into the right. So while you're thinking about a question, you're sitting here looking down into the right on the quiz. And if you haven't shown me what's down into the right, I don't know what's there. And if I don't know what's there, you're gonna lose points, All right? Again, it's, it's, it's a matter of the integrity of the class. So the more apparent you can make your environment, uh, the more flexible I can be about when you're looking away or you're rubbing your head or you're blowing your nose or doing those types of things. It is important to show your workspace. If you don't show your workspace, you are gonna lose points, right? And then again, no electronic devices. Uh, there shouldn't be any papers or any other resources. Right, you have that. Um, you have that. Um, uh, what's it called? The little. Uh, I can't think of it. the thing with the pencil where you guys drew the star. 
Uh, you have a little worksheet basically that you can bring up that you can make your notes if you have your mnemonics and you want to type them there. So you have them there as a reminder. That's fine to do that. Uh, you can do that. Uh, use the magnification when on the lab exam to make things bigger like you did to on that quiz as well, uh, especially if you're on a Mac. I know, Max, it's really simple to enlarge your screen size, but if you do that during the quiz, Proctorio will kick you out. So use the magnification that is in the Proctorio. Use the worksheet that is in the Proctorio. There's no uh, scratch paper that you can have on next to your desk or anything like that. Your desk should be clear or your work environment should be clear and make sure you show that correctly. A oh, quick question. Yes. Uh, when it comes to uh, enlarging like the picture, so when I was doing it, it shows a little picture in the middle of the screen and I'm assuming by enlarging it, it was saying that it's going to enlarge that little picture so I can see it clear. Yes. Uh, like, uh, yeah. So when I was doing it, what he was doing, he was enlarging the whole page, but not, exactly. the little, the, not the little picture that says like gap or something or... It, it, did enlarge, it does enlarge the whole page. Uh, it sometimes will reset the page, so you may have to scroll to where you need to go because if the page is too big, you may have to scroll left and right as well as up and down to be able to get to it. But you should be able to enlarge things large enough. And again, I purposely made that very, very tiny. The images oh, okay. on the quiz are not going to be that tiny. I'm going to yeah. try to make them more obvious. So, uh, but so you shouldn't have to magnify it more than once or twice to really get a decent view of what it is that you're doing. You. Okay. Okay. But I purposely made that small because I didn't want you to be able to see it without it. Again, the point of that was to teach you the tools, right? So that you understand the tools that are available to you in Proctorio. Okay. All right, as I mentioned, most of our lab assignments, and again, that is the keyword there, most, because what does most mean? All. Uh, not all, exactly. Most, again, are for completeness. Uh, so again, you, as long as you're putting time and effort into it, you will get the points for it. So make sure you're doing the homeworks, so make sure you're turning them in on time. I have had numerous uh, instances in the past where <laughs> students have done really well on the exams, but they weren't doing the homework or they were consistently turning in late. And as you continue to lose those points, I've had several students who ended up with Bs instead of As, even though they were getting As on the exams because they weren't completing the homework assignments and they weren't turning them in on time. Homework is free points for studying. Put time and effort into this material and you are gonna be successful. Okay. Finally, the goal of this class is, as we were talking about earlier, for me to prepare you for 431. Not only do you need to learn this material, but everything I've picked from this class helps you to be successful in 431 as well, as long as you remember this information for 431. So to encourage you to not just, you know, cram and purge the information on the exams, but actually retain some of this information, you have a 100 point cumulative final exam as well. And that will help you to make sure you've mastered this material and be prepared for 431. All right, the last bit of points, as it says here, you have 15 participation points. These participation points are for hopefully coming and being active, <coughs> asking questions, but as long as you're here and you are participating, you're being active in the class, you will get those 15 points. Again, this is a grade. It is not extra credit. Everybody here is here right now, so you're getting your 15 points of extra credit. I mean, it picks 15 points for that out of 15 uh, for that. But again, if you're not showing up on class, I expect you to be here. I expect you to participate. I expect you to take the quizzes. Again, there will be daily quizzes. Uh, sometimes first thing in the morning, sometimes in the middle of the lecture, sometimes at the end of the lecture, uh, there will be quizzes. So it is important to be here and to be, and again, by end of lecture, I mean when I'm done talking, not necessarily at 12, you know, 35. So don't just show up at 12.30 expecting to take a quiz because uh, we may have taken it a half an hour before then. All right. And this class is about points, right? One of the important things is to uh, understand about points. Uh, anybody here play golf? No. Heard of golf? Know what a golf ball is? Yes. yes. Played a couple times. Perfect. Excellent. All right. In golf, if you had a 300 uh, yard drive, how many strokes does that count as? One. Excellent. If you hit a two inch putt, how many strokes does that count as? 
one. Exactly, right? No, not two, Cody, just one. <laughs> Don't play golf, huh? Um, one, exactly. Strokes are strokes are strokes. Every time you swing the stick, it counts. Doesn't matter how far it goes, right? Strokes are strokes are strokes. Well, that's how it is in this class. Points are points are points. One point on the homework counts the same as one point on a lab exam, counts the same as one point on the final, counts the same as one point on a physio X, right? This class is about maximizing your points. As I mentioned, and again, uh, because uh, there is some curve on the exams, I may curve the exams if it is needed. I don't have an exact total, but we're gonna finish the class somewhere around 1200 points. So if you want an A in the class, you need 90% of the points. And it is 90% of the points. You decide your grade in this class. There's tremendous beauty to this. If every single person in this class gets 90% of the points, every single person in this class will get an A. So it's not competitive. You're all working together to be successful on this, all right? But like I said, uh, there will be some extra credit opportunities. All the extra credit opportunities are going to be involved in the class, like the five for fives that we're doing, and maybe some other activities. But I will, if needed, curve the exams. Uh, there's extra credit, there's your participation grade, there's the free points for doing the homework correctly or completely, all those things. If with all those things you still can't get 90% of the points, then you didn't deserve an A. So it is important to make sure that you pay attention to your points, maximize your points, and do the things that you can to do that. All right. Uh, and I think that's everything that I wanted to say about that. Questions on that? I did want to come back up here real quickly. Uh, up here. Again, method of instruction. And in lecture is going to be like this. I'm going to be talking, showing you things on screen. Oh, uh, yes, Jason, you have a question? Jason Estrada raised his hand. Okay. Um, lecture is going to be like this. I'm going to be showing stuff on the screen, usually the PowerPoint slides. Uh, you have those. Uh, you can print them out if you want, or you can follow along on Canvas if you want. And uh, I expect it to be interactive. I'm going to ask questions. I expect you to answer them. Uh, I expect you to ask me questions and I'll answer them. The more interactive it is, the better it's going to be, right? I, if, I, if I was just wanted to sit here and talk to myself, I would just record these things and I would sleep in, right? I'm doing this live because I expect this to be interactive. I want this to be a good learning experience for everybody, okay? Uh, lab is going to uh, be a lot more challenging. Like I said, you are in the unique situation where you're the first class, as far as I'm aware, in the history of uh, American River College taking A and P completely online. Like I said, that means you are going to not have a chance to do uh, the rat dissection. Uh, you are not gonna have the opportunity um, to hold a bone in your hand, to hold the muscles in your hand, right? To do a sheep brain dissection. There are a lot of opportunities you guys are gonna be missing out on. And one of the nice things about 430 is I get to hold your hand a little bit more as we work together through the lab material. But our lab time isn't going to be spent that way. So one of the things is it's putting a lot bigger onus on you to take the initiative to spend the time with the materials, with your atlases, with the resources that are online to make sure you're getting this material. Because just because we're taking it online doesn't mean that you don't have the same expectations. I don't know yet what's happening in the fall. They say fall is going to be online as well. That is the most recent thing I've heard, but maybe they will change that and allow some labs on campus. I don't know what's going to be happening, but whether you complete 431 in the fall or maybe wait till spring when it's hopefully will be back online or everything that goes along with that, or when you get to your nursing program, you're gonna be expected to know this material. So I have set the same standard that I would if we were in the classroom. And that puts a lot more of the responsibility on you. So make sure you're comfortable and aware of that coming into this. It's going to be a challenge. And this is going to be new. We had a little bit of a learning from the end of last semester, but that was only the second half of the class. The first half of this class has never been done online before. So this is going to be a new experience for all of us. 
and there are going to be some growing pains. And the problem with that is growing pains take time to learn from. And time is the one thing we don't have in this class. Uh, summer school is brutal. Uh, as I said in the emails that I sent to you, I usually spend the first hour of class telling you all the bad reasons why you shouldn't take this class during the summer. Right? Success in this class is based on the amount of time you can put into it. And the problem with summer is you're getting the information twice as fast and you have less than half the time to study it. Think about spring. If you took this class in spring, you had four and a half hours of lecture on Monday, and then you had Tuesday off to unpack that material. Four and a half hours of class on Wednesday, and then you had five days off to process all that information, make sense of that information before you had to go back on Monday. Now, four and a half hours of information today, then four and a half inf hours of information tomorrow, then one day off, then four and a half hours on Thursday, four and a half hours on Friday, two days off, and we come back and do it again. During the normal semester, five exams. During summer, four. That means the first two exams, which are usually the hardest. The first exam is hard because most people aren't familiar with taking a real science class. Chemistry doesn't count. So they're not quite prepared for the level of responsibility that a class like this does. So a lot of people struggle. And the second exam is histology. It's all microscopes, 100% microscope stuff. Right? Those two exams are now combined into one. And you have it two weeks from today. Right? It's there, the ARC recommends that for every hour of lecture, you spend three hours studying at home. And for every hour of lab, you spend one hour studying at home. Well, I'm going to talk for at least three hours every day. So that's 12 hours a week times three is 36. And then an hour and a half of lecture, I mean of lab every day, which is six more hours. That's 40 hours, that's 42 hours. That's more than a full-time job. One of the things that I saw on the student info sheets is a lot of people said that they are taking other classes uh, during the summer. Now I promised my wife I wouldn't call you guys stupid, but if you are taking this class, I think that's a mistake. Never in my entire academic career did I take a summer school class, right? But I understand a lot of you feel the responsibility of time. I just want you to fully understand what you're getting yourselves into. But taking this and another class during the summer is crazy. There's not enough hours in the day to be successful with that, right? The problem with the online format from what I've seen is it requires a lot of busy work. So if you're trying to take this, which has a lot of busy work, and another class that likely has a lot of busy work, and this, and this grade matters for most students. So again, I, I, I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be scary. I know it comes off that way. But one of the things that I love about this class is that this class is hard. And the reason I love that is I can be very straightforward. I, can be, I don't have to be tricky. I can tell you X, Y, and Z is going to be on the exam because I know you're still going to have to spend hours and hours mastering X, Y, and Z. And so the advantage of being tricky is that I can be very standard, very straightforward, very simple, and uh, you know exactly what to expect. And the important thing about that is the learning process doesn't get in the way of you showing me you have this information. And one of my biggest fears about this class with this online format is that this online format, the process gets in the way of showing me the information. And so again, I just, I want you all to, I know how important this class is to all of you. And so I just want you to fully understand what you guys are getting yourself into with this class. All right. All right, so that is that. Let's talk about, uh, oh, lab assignments, like I said, for completeness, for most of them. Again, there will be a few that will be graded for correctness. I will warn you when that is going to occur. And like I said, extra credit. All the extra credit is going to involve working in the class. Uh, so like the five or fives where you're meeting with me, there may be some other activities that I will have you do that will be for extra credit as well. Um, there's one other thing that I'll talk about in a minute. But what I don't do for extra credit is give special extra credit assignments. Because what happens is someone doesn't do well on the first exam. And they come to me and they say, hey, I didn't do well in the first exam. Can I have an extra credit paper that I can write for you so that I can get some, make those points up? 
And if I say yes and give that to them, then that student is going to spend all their time working on that extra credit assignment and they're not going to be preparing for the next exam. And so when the next exam comes around, guess what? They don't do well. And suddenly they need more extra credit again. And then this continues and then suddenly it's independent study. And that's not what this is. All of the, home, all of the extra credit that is going to be available will be available within the class itself. Now, there is one other extra credit opportunity that I encourage you to take advantage of, uh, not just because it's extra credit, but because it's going to help you in the class. And that is the open labs. On Wednesdays, we have a uh, instructor assistant by the name of Jeff Chingaris who is set up a, uh, a, a open lab. He's got two cameras. He's got a bunch of resources, bones and models and other materials from the classroom. And what he is going to do is he is going to be online in Zoom. So I should make that clear. Uh, online in Zoom. Uh, and he is going to be available for you to go in, check in. He's going to be uh, uh, um, answering questions. He will be demonstrating models and bones and materials and things along those lines. And you can go and ask questions and observe that material. When you go in, you check with, in with him, give him your name and student ID, uh, and he will check you in. When you leave, make sure you let him know to check out, because if you forget to check out, then you default to one hour. Uh, but if you go to the open labs and, and ask questions or just sit and watch the open labs, for every hour that you spend in open lab, I will give you one point of extra credit, up to 15 points. So you can get up to 15 points. And again, it's not all or nothing. If you're only able to make it to, you know, six hours of open lab, you'll get six points of extra credit. If you go to 40, that's going to be even better. But you'll still only get 15 points of extra credit. Yes. Oh, Cody, you're, uh, you're muted. How long will he be doing classes on uh, Wednesdays? It's a long time. If you look, if we go here, uh, let's cheat and leave the syllabus. If we go to, I don't remember if I put it in pages. Yep, here we go. Okay. So under pages, open lab, and here's also the link to it as well. From So if, notice from 10.30 to 8.30. So he's there for a massive amount of time on Wednesday. So hopefully it's flexible with your schedule. Uh, you can uh, go in there. There's no password. Uh, giving you a quote here from him, what it is. Again, it's useful. You get 15 points of extra credit. But more important than that, if you spend 15 hours in that open lab listening to Jeff and asking Jeff questions, you're going to get a lot more than those 15 points of extra credit when it comes to taking the exams. So again, this is another really great way of, since you can't hold the bones in your hand, have somebody else hold them for you and walk you through them. So it's a great activity that if you're able to pick, partake in, definitely do it. Just make sure you check in with him when you enter and check in with him when you leave to make sure that you get full credit for being there. All right. All righty. Uh, back to the syllabus real quickly, just because there's two more things that I wanted to go over. Again, all the things down here at the bottom, uh, the accommodations, oh, the, here, no makeup exams. Again, because of the speed of uh, summer school, uh, and the requirement that this be an, a, a synchronous class, the exams are just during the class time and just on those days. So if you look at the schedule and you see that there's a conflict, uh, let me know. And if there is a serious emergency, something serious happens, I, may, I will try to grant a, um, make an exception, but I can't guarantee it. And so because it can't be guaranteed just because of the pace of the class, I have to set up the rule that there are no makeup exams, but we will try to make accommodations if necessary for someone. Obviously, the sooner you make me aware of it, the better. Uh, obviously, it's hard to schedule you know, car accidents days in advance, so I understand that emergencies happen, uh, but uh, try to communicate with me. And again, if you're being rushed to the emergency room, I shouldn't be the first person you call, uh, but try to communicate with me and we will try to make those, um, those accommodations as necessary. Speaking of accommodations, if you have a DSBS accommodations, uh, we can, like additional time and things like that, that are things that can be done. I just need the paperwork, so make sure you get that done. That paperwork sometimes takes time. Uh, and uh, um, we, we, you know, our tests are right around the corner. 
Uh, academic honesty. Again, as I mentioned, the, the challenge, one of the challenges, like I said, is the process gets in the way and that the Proctorio is a challenge. I appreciate and understand that. Uh, so again, it is important to make sure that all of your smart devices are put away. You do not have notes or any other types of paper out on your desk. Other computers should not be on or in your area. And make sure you have a clean area that you're doing it and make sure you slowly scan your clean area. Again, I don't care about the potted plant you have over in the corner of your room or what's on your ceiling. I care about your workspace when you're scanning your environment. So make sure you do that properly. Uh, last thing on this, again, obviously everybody who's here is here. If somebody is not here, they are going to be dropped. And so we will be doing, when I'm done with the introduction, uh, we will um, uh, take our final roll, take a look at that, and I will be adding students. And anybody who's not here is going to be dropped. The same thing will happen tomorrow as well. It is important to be here tomorrow as well. Again, you guys appreciate and understand how challenging it can be to get into this class. There are still some people who have... Uh, uh, prerequisite issues or other issues you should have received emails from me on this everybody should have received an email under your participation uh, real quickly if you've received at least one email from me give me a yes if you have not received any emails from me give me a no for everybody who's here so there's yes and no under that I want you to click either yes and no to see if everybody because again, I want to make sure that there isn't anybody who has not received an email. I will be sending emails um, through your Los Rios email address. So make sure you are checking your Los Rios email address frequently. Uh, you can set it up so that it, um, so that it forwards to whatever your normal email address is. So if you're on Gmail all the time, uh, you can do that. That's fine. Come on. I either want it in chat or I want a yes or no's. That's uh, still trying to figure it out. Okay, no worries. Uh, hit, if you click the participation, when you bring up your participation window at the bottom, there are uh, uh, buttons that you can push, like go slower, go faster, raise your hand, yes, no, things along those lines. There we go. Um, the other thing that I will occasionally do is I will make announcements on Canvas. And so if you have your Canvas notifications up, you'll get those notifications as well. But email is a much more efficient way of getting large chunks of information out there. So make sure you're checking it regularly. Uh, so again, there's some people who still have their prerequisite issues to resolve and a couple other issues that need to be resolved. I'm hoping to have enrollment issues finalized by tomorrow. And then once we have our class finalized at whatever it is, uh, then that will be it. Again, I won't um, at that. So if you miss class today, obviously everybody here heard this, uh, I will drop you. If you miss tomorrow though, I will drop you as well. After that, this is college, you're adult, you're responsible for your schedule. One of the important things to remember is that a class like this, really all classes, you only get three attempts at. And even this, though this is summer school, this counts as one of your three attempts. So after this first week, if you decide you don't like this class and you never show up again, that's okay. This is college, you're adults, that's fine. But you're responsible for dropping yourself from this class. I will drop students to make room for other students so that we have the proper number of students enrolled. After that, you are responsible for your schedule. And notice the last day to drop without a W is the 12th. That's nice, it gives you a week to figure out if you like this class or not. And then if you don't, then you have the opportunity to drop it. You get a full refund. It doesn't count on your transcript and it doesn't count as one of your three attempts. If you're here past the 12th, this counts. You're getting a grade. It can be a W, you have up to July 17th to get a W, but it will count as a grade in some form and it will count as one of your three attempts. So it is important to keep track of your schedule that way. All right, so again, please be aware of that. Uh, the last thing and the reason that I wanted to come to the syllabus here on this page, because not only does it have our schedule of when things are going to go, and this is basically what's going to be happening in the class, but what I love about Canvas is this course summary down here at the bottom. At the very bottom of the syllabus, it shows you all of the assignments you're going to have and when they are due. And you can actually click on these assignments and they will actually take you to that assignment. So for instance, if you have not taken your attendance quiz yet, then you haven't told me you are here. So first and foremost, shame on you. But uh, what you'll need to do is click that attendance quiz, 
come here and take that quiz. And for those of you who have not taken it yet, the access code for this is boot. So if you have not done that yet, make sure you do that. There's one question you're just saying if you're enrolled or waitlisted, uh, do that if you have not done that already on this. The majority of the work we're going to be doing is going to be here on Canvas, so I do want to do a quick tour of Canvas. Again, obviously, we have our home page. My contact information is here. Uh, the announcements are going to be here, so as you have announcements, those things are here to remind you of those things that are coming up. But here's some of the more important stuff. Here are our pages. Notice this starts with our home page, but you can also view all the pages. This is where our Proctorio protocols are located. As I mentioned, this is where you'll find the information for the open lab. And there may be additional uh, pages that I add for you as well. Obviously, you're all here, so you know how to use the confirmed Zoom. And we just did the syllabus. Hopefully, and again, this is because my student account, uh, you need to click the secure proctor exam button uh, to sync up your uh, Proctorio application with your Canvas. Uh, so if you haven't done that, make sure that you do that. You do have to use Canvas for your, um, I'm sorry, Chrome, not Canvas, Chrome for your, uh, for taking the exams in the Proctorio for that this way. Your quizzes are going to be located here. So again, this is where you'll see all the quizzes that you're going to be responsible for. And notice also we see we have a practice lab exam next week uh, to see how you guys are studying. But where you're going to be spending most of your time is here in the modules. This is where we have our getting started stuff. These are all the things that we should be doing over the first two days to get everything ready and prepared. Here is study tools and that page for the open lab. These are some great websites for anatomy and other things that you can have as well, including my YouTube page for our lectures. I will try to get them up the same day, but again, these files tend to be huge. And so sometimes it takes a day or two before it goes up. And again, because we have a class the next day, it doesn't behoove you to just rely on the YouTube pages for the lectures, because if Mondays isn't posted till Tuesday afternoon, then you're already two lectures behind. So it is important to be here. Um, here, under each section is where everything is formatted. First, we have the assignments, and we'll come back to those in just a minute, but it's a nice reminder of all the assignments that are gonna be due. Here are your lecture handouts. These are all the PowerPoint slides that I will be using. As you can see, they're already posted. I do tinker with them a little bit. Sometimes as I'm getting ready in the morning, I may change a word or switch the order of the slides. But for the most part, they are correct. Uh, and again, what I see these as is an outline. This is kind of your outline slash study guide. What this is, is this is a reminder to me as we go through it for the things that we are going to be talking about in lecture. You are responsible for everything we talk about in lecture, not just what's on the slide, right? So again, it's important to remember that reading the slides is not an alternative to coming to class or listening to the class, because what those are are the highlights, and then we will be much more descriptive in talking about them on there. And like I said, you are responsible for everything we talk about in class. I know different Instructors have different um, philosophies on how they teach a class. The way I see my job in this class is to be your tour guide, right? If you go to Paris for the weekend, you don't just start in the upper north corner of Paris and go street by street through all of Paris. It's much easier if you have a tour guide who can take you to the 12 most important places. Well, that's what this class is gonna be like. If you look in chapter one, chapter one may have 20 concepts in it. But in class, we're only gonna talk about 12. And those 12 are what you're gonna be tested on, all right? So what that means is if there's a piece of information that is in your textbook that we don't talk about in lecture, you don't do a homework assignment about, there isn't a lab simulator or something like that that involves it or any of those kind of concepts, then you're not gonna be responsible for it on the exam. You're responsible for the things that we cover in this class. So I am trimming the fat and focusing on the things that are most important. However, because I'm doing that, you have a responsibility to show me depth of information. I usually use a pen and a half of red ink 
on the first test, writing, describe, explain, and on the exams. Where people typically lose points is by not being descriptive enough. You need to give me specificities. You need to give me details. That is how you're going to maximize your points on the exam. So really, these are your study guides for the lecture. For the lab, we have handouts here. Now, notice it starts with epithelial tissues because when we talk about regional terms, you're responsible for all regional terms. Uh, when we talk about the cell, you're responsible for all the anatomy of the cell. So it's redundant for me to make a study guide for that. However, when we're talking about epithelial tissues, there are dozens of epithelial tissues and every one of them probably has 40 different characteristics you could be responsible for. What you have here is a precise list of which tissues and which characteristics of those tissues you're gonna be responsible for. So this here in, your, in the lab handouts is your study guides for the lab portion. And again, when I say lecture and lab portion, I'm really talking about how we're studying the material, how we're learning the material. When it comes to the exams, you are responsible for all the information on all of the exams. Yes, lecture exams tend to lend themselves more for descriptions, describing processes. But I could ask you to identify structures on a lecture exam. A lab exam lends itself more to identifying structures. What is this? What is this? What is this? But I could also ask you, what does this thing do on it as well? I see lecture and lab as two different modalities for learning the material. But this is one class with one concept, and you are responsible for all the material on all of the exams. All right. Under that are our lab simulators. These are all assignments that you're going to be doing, even using Labster or PhysioX, which I'll show you, and a bio-interactive, which I found that was really interesting as well. And there's two more sections in our module. The first are the answer keys. As I mentioned, I am checking your reviews for completeness. I am looking to see that you are putting time and effort into it. And remember, I said if you got something wrong, you weren't going to lose points on it. But you still need to know that information. Also, because of the speed of this class, it may take me a week to get your reviews graded. Right? But I want the reviews, because they're homework, to be learning processes. So on the day that an assignment is due, that afternoon, the review for it, the review key, will post. That way, you can look at the key, see what you got right, see what you got wrong, and understand the material and then you'll get the grade for the work that you put into it. Because like I said, if you, get some, if you get question one wrong on the review, and then that question happens to be on the exam, and you write the exact same answer on the exam, you're gonna get it wrong and lose points. So it is important to know what is right and what is wrong, even though you're just getting points for effort by putting the time and effort into it. So these keys help to make sure that you have that. The last thing down here, and you notice there's nothing in it yet, is the lecture images. Uh, in describing these things, sometimes I will do some elaborate drawings or things like that. Or again, I, I say elaborate, but I'm not a good artist by any sense. And uh, trying to use the computer to draw it makes it even worse. But sometimes those visuals can be useful. So sometimes when I do that, I will take a screenshot of that and put that on here for you so that you have that to refer to as we are learning the material. All right. So this is where you're going to be spending a lot of your time. Where you're going to be spending most of the rest of your time is in the My Lab and Mastering. Now again, uh, when you click on this link, every student has a free two week trial to that. I don't actually have a student account. So for this, what I need to do is switch this for a second. Uh, grab my water while we're at it. All righty. All right, when you go, now again, this is my instructor version, so yours will look slightly different, but this will show us the things that I wanted to show you. Uh, the first is the e-text. The e-text is a really, really powerful, useful tool for those of you who are not familiar and haven't used it before. Uh, one of the things that Pearson did with this 11th edition is they made it very interactive. 
Uh, so there's a lot of uh, worthwhile materials and stuff like this as you work your way through it. However, what I like the most and what's most powerful about it is the search. So for instance, when we're talking about mitosis, if you didn't understand that part of the lecture or, or struggled with it, you can do a search and it will show you all the places where you find it. It'll show you the images and the figures uh, for them. So for instance, we could click on that and go there. Here it has the glossary and it has a list of all the locations where it talks about it. And so you can click on that and it will take you straight there. Uh, on this, you have the opportunity to, uh, my tools, there we go. Change the settings, you can highlight material. Uh, you can, uh, uh, sorry, you can highlight material, you can put notes in here. There's all these different resources and tools that you can use uh, to be able to work with and learn this material. So it's really, really powerful tool. You can set bookmarks, you can do all these types of things in here. Like I said, it is really useful. Uh, so you can click that, you can highlight that, you can make a note saying, um, He said this will be on the exam. And what's cool about it is that it's permanent. So when you come back to this tomorrow or you come back to it next semester, uh, those notes, those bookmarks are gonna be there. You can download chapters to your smart devices. So if you're going camping for the weekend and you're gonna be out of Wi-Fi, you can do that. And any annotations you make in that, when you get home, you can sync it back to your permanent copy that you have on there. So it is a really powerful tool. It's a really good e-text. So again, it's a good tool for those of you who are comfortable with that. However, the other part that we're gonna be using a lot, as you can see here, I'm gonna move my windows and stuff around, uh, is the uh, study area. When you click on and go to the study area, I think I already opened it, but I'll open it again. This is where you're, not shockingly, going to be doing a lot of your studying. There are a couple ways you can do this. Notice also this is a place where you can access the e-text. One of the easiest ways to see what is available to you is to study by chapter. When you study by chapter and you click on a link, like so for instance, human body and orientation, it gives you the e-text from the textbook, it gives you a flashcard maker, uh, there's an MP3 tutorial, it shows you some other resources. Again, the first chapter is kind of boring. Uh, so if we go to like, for instance, when we get to the muscle tissue, you'll see that there are a lot more resources that are here that are available to you, including some videos and some great resources that are on here. A and P flicks is amazing uh, that we'll take a look at later. So there's a lot of great resources there. The other thing where you're going to be spending a lot of time is right here, your physio X. So your physio, oh, let's get, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, we have an interactive physiology. This is a great tutorial that I'm going to assign some as we get into more physiological processes. So as we go down here, uh, you can see that for tissues and bones, there's some and muscular system and the nervous system. It's going to be something that we're going to use a lot. The two resources you're going to use the most, though, is going to be your practice anatomy lab and the PhysioX. This practice anatomy lab is going to be what is going to allow you to study and learn the bones. So when we are learning the bones, for instance, we can look at the axial skeleton. Notice we have the cadaver option. So we can actually look at the actual bones of the skull. We can identify them and label them and see the bones and identify them that way. Some of these images can be rotated or as you go through them, there'll be different views. As you get more comfortable, you can take a quiz where it'll point to a bone or a bone feature and you have to guess what that is. And you can check your answer and hey, what do you know? I got it correct. Or when you're feeling particularly frisky, you can take the lab practical. In the lab practical, they will show you a bone feature and then you actually have to write in what the correct answer is. It's a great way of learning this material. When we get to the muscular system, we can look at the limbs. And again, it's fun to look at the cadaver to go through the different layers of that. But what's gonna be more helpful for you if you notice down here, anatomical models, muscular system, upper limb, 
what you have is an image of a model that is identical to the one that's in the, in the classroom, identical to the one that we have pictures of that you're going to be responsible for. So again, it is a way to learn and gain this information and study this information. I notice there are animations, there's a lot of great resources, and again, you always have the quizzes and the lab practicals. Uh, there's also some histology here. It's not quite as extensive as a histology atlas, but it's not bad starting point for things like that. So again, this is a great tool that is gonna help you with the lab. There are no assignments directly from this, but it is gonna help you to be successful on the lab. It's a great way to study the material. Where you will have some graded assignments is in the PhysioX. PhysioX is a lab simulator. So when we go to that PhysioX exercise, this lab simulator, uh, and again, one of the things that you're gonna have do in this section is gonna be exercise one where we are learning about uh, the transport mechanisms and permeability exercises. So we're gonna be doing that. And there are five different activities. And basically it walks you through uh, giving you an explanation of your uh, objectives. You're going to go through all of these activities, take a pre-test, do all of these things. And notice as you go through them, and I'm rushing through this uh, because we're covering so much information, but you want to always submit these things to a lab report. Then you're gonna do uh, the activities, drag your, drag your 20 molecular weight cutoff uh, to that. Then next, it's gonna have you dispense sodium chloride on one side and another. And, and you're gonna go through this thing step by step, doing the experiment. After you do the experiment, there's gonna be a quiz to take at the end of the experiment. After that, there's gonna be a review sheet where you're gonna answer review questions and at the end of all of that, you're gonna have a lab report. Now notice my lab report isn't that impressive because I didn't do anything. But yours will be much more extensive. And this lab report you are gonna turn into me. The way you turn this into me is by doing a printable version. Put your name into that. And then print it. Now you can do two things. You can kill a tree by printing it out as paper and then uh, taking pictures of it and scanning it in or something like that. But the easiest thing to do is with your print option to save it as a PDF. You save it as a PDF to your desktop. Let's do X exercise one, save that to my desktop. Boom, we're there, excellent. And then what you're going to do, I have to switch, so hold on. When you go back to your modules, Lab Simulators, Physio X, Exercise 1. And again, this is really going to be true for all of your assignments. When you go to the assignments, what you're going to do is you're going to submit the assignment here. So I'm going to submit the assignment. I'm going to browse my desktop. I'm going to grab that file. and I'm gonna submit it. And so it'll be submitted that way. And that's really how you're gonna submit all of your assignments. So, oh, hey, wait, look at that, I got confetti. So you're gonna submit all of your assignments. Notice there are five different activities, you're gonna have five different lab reports. So you're gonna submit those that way. Your unit reviews work the same way. You can do an electronic version of it or you can print it out and take pictures of them and submit them that way. But when you come to the unit review, you're gonna to go to the unit review and you're gonna submit the assignment in the exact same way. All of your homework assignments are gonna be submitted this way. So you'll submit the assignment from that activity in the modules. All right, and that is the Physio X. Questions on any of that? All right, I know we've covered a lot of material. Uh, what am I doing? Um, do that. All right, so I think that is everything. Let me look at my cheat sheet here.
I think that is everything that I wanted to do from an introductory standpoint. So here's the first most important question. Is there anybody here who has not done the attendance, um, who has not done the attendance quiz yet? The people who are giving me the check marks, does that mean you've done it or you have not done it? Give me a no if you have not done the attendance quiz. All right, if you've not done the attendance quiz, then make sure you do that. Again, the, um, the code for that is boot. Also, I need, so here, let's actually go back to this page. All right, so here's what's gonna happen. We are gonna take our first break. So again, the access code for boot is for anybody who has not taken the attendance quiz, you need to do that. Uh, the first thing that I have to do is take care of some housekeeping issues. So uh, what we're going to do is take a break. Um, It's always a bad thing when I can't read my own handwriting. All right, if one of these five people are here, if any of these five people are here, at the beginning of the break, I need to speak to you. So what you need to do is send me a private message via chat uh, because uh, you either don't have the prerequisite or there's some other issue. Uh, with your enrollment in the class that have to be resolved and we'll, we, so we deal with that. Then what will happen is I will get a chance to look at the enrollment and see who's here and who isn't and uh, add give and then I will do add numbers and tell the people who can add the people uh, that can add will be able to add. So what we'll do is we'll come up with a second list and that will be the add list. And then uh, if you get an ad, if your name is added to the add list, then what I'll need is for you to contact me via um, email after class today and I will send you the ad slip. So let's not deal with that now, but you guys got to give me uh, 10 minutes to be able to do that. All right. So um, what I need, so let's go ahead and take, this will take a little bit longer break. Let's come back at 930. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording, come back at 930 so that we can do some housekeeping things. And at 930, we will start into the lecture. All right. Any questions? All right, so let me deal with the first group of people, then we'll worry about the ads, and then we will uh, finally be done with the introduction and we can start talking uh, class material that you're gonna be responsible for. All right, excellent. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording, come back at 9.30, so let me write that too. And I need to write myself a reminder to start the recording again. Otherwise, we'll be 20 minutes in and then I will remember. So here is the deal. These seven students uh, by last name are all uh, ads. What I need you to do after class today is to email me. Uh, when you email me, I will send you the information and the ad slip so that you were able to add the class. Make sure you add the class today. Uh, the way the computer updates is that uh, the computer only updates once overnight. So if you add today, you will officially show up in my wait list tomorrow morning. If you are not officially on my wait list tomorrow morning, you will lose your priority to add and I will add somebody else instead. So make sure you email me today so you can get that ad slip so you can do that today. If you're not one of those seven people, um, I may scare some more people off as we continue to talk. There are still a couple of these people over here. I talked to a couple of you during the break, but there's still a couple people who still need to speak with me. Uh, so a couple more spots may open up tomorrow. So if I wasn't able to add you today, but you are really, even after all of this, still wanting to add the class, then I encourage you to uh, stick around for the lecture so that you get all the material that you're able to. As a waitlisted student that was here today, you still have access to Canvas, so I expect you to do the chemistry quiz and do everything else 
that needs to be due tomorrow, get it done. Uh, and so that hopefully I'll be able to add more students tomorrow as well. All right. So questions on any of that before we get started. So again, these are the people who were able to add for today. If you weren't able to add today, stick around and, uh, and then hopefully we'll be able to add more tomorrow. And again, if you are some of these people who still haven't talked to me, make sure you talk to me because uh, if I don't hear from you by tomorrow, uh, you will be dropped and or lose your priority to add the class. All righty. All right, excellent. With all of that, we are finally done, thankfully, with all of the housekeeping stuff. And so instead, we can focus on lecture. Now for lecture, I tend to talk animatedly, but you don't need to be uh, distracted by my face. So unless I need to show you something, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my video off. If you wanna turn your video off as well. Again, the way I look at this is this is college, you're adults. Right. Uh, I'm sure all of you have been in classes where you've looked over and someone's been asleep in class. Right. You're responsible for this information. You're responsible for making sure you get this information. So if you want to lay in your bed more comfortably, right, and don't want all of us to see it, that is fine. You're welcome to do that. I'll turn the video on as necessary uh, if I need to demonstrate something for you. Uh, but while we're going through the lectures, you'd be focusing on the slide and not on my five head anyway. So uh, we'll go ahead and shut that down. Uh, and then uh, we can move forward from here. So like I said, as I mentioned, you're basically responsible for everything we talk about in class. Now, just because we're turning off the cameras does not mean that I don't expect this to be interactive. I still expect you to ask questions. I still expect you to answer when I ask questions as well. So I need to move my tools around so that I have all my toys to play with. That goes there. And that goes there. Perfect. All right, excellent. So uh, one of the things that it is important to make sure that we understand is that this class is an anatomy and physiology class. Uh, I see anatomy and physiology as a big circle. And see, now that I've turned it off, I'm going to turn it back on again. I see it as a big circle. Anatomy and physiology is a big circle. One uh, a philosophy in teaching the class is divide them separately, teach anatomy and physiology separately. Uh, that is good from a um, administrative standpoint, because for an administrative standpoint, you can get both of those uh, students can take either one first, so you can get more butts in seats for something like that. Uh, but it isn't intuitive for learning. Anatomy by itself is what? When we define anatomy, you know, I've also taught the 100 and 102 version of this class. How do we define anatomy? What is anatomy? Can someone tell me what anatomy is? The structures of the body, I don't know. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. Anatomy is the study of the structures of the body. Absolutely. And if you were just taking an anatomy class and really just was anatomy, then all you'd be doing is learning a list of terms. All right. Physiology, on the other hand, is what? Function. There you go. It is the study of the functions of the body. And again, in a, in a physiology class, it's impossible to just talk functions if you're not don't can't identify with the structures that you're dealing with. So while some classes divided left and right, we divided top and bottom. We anatomy and physiology are intimately interlinked with each other. The structure of something determines how it functions. How something functions determines its structure. And so those two things go hand in hand. Yes, Ryan, did you have a question? Yeah, um, what is the scope of functions? Oh, ah, well, isn't that, that, that is a great question, right? Really for structures and functions, the key to all of these is these are incredibly uh, general definitions, right? And you're absolutely correct with that. If you think of it in terms of anatomy, there are many levels and many subdivisions. Here, we see a so small list of the anatomical subdivisions surface anatomy, gross anatomy, systemic anatomy, right? Cytology is the study of, of cells, right? Um, 
what's surface anatomy? Anyone know what surface anatomy is? So, <laughs> maybe like Nobody? the skin. I'm sorry? Like well, the skin. Well, it can involve the skin, but if it was just the skin, then wouldn't that really just be dermatology? Top layer of whatever you're studying. Top layer is getting closer, absolutely, right? It is, it is things that can be seen from the surface or felt from the surface. Right. If you think about it, if when we get to the muscular system, right, I start showing you old pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger during the day, will we be able to define particular muscles by the cut of his body as we look at it? Or when we get to the skeletal system, if I bring Kate Moss in here and show some of her pictures, will we be able to count her ribs by looking at the surface of her body? Yeah, surface anatomy, things that can be touched or felt or seen from the surface of the body. Absolutely, so those are correct. And to answer your original question, the same way we have all these subdivisions of anatomy, we have all these subdivisions of physiology as well. Something as simple as how the cells function to how different organ systems function, to specific organ systems like endocrinology, the study of our hormones or cardiovascular physiology. But there's all these different uh, levels and subdivisions that we can study this material. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Ryan? Yeah. Excellent, mm -hmm. awesome, okay. perfect. All right, excellent. So we have all these subdivisions. Now, the other place we have subdivisions is in the organization of the body itself. Right? Any good textbook worth its salt uh, talks about the different levels of organization. And really the key magical term for this is hierarchy, right? Hierarchy is something that is in the news a lot these days. Right, we have the president on top and then the vice president and I think they're dukes or I don't know. I, nobody understands politics. So let's talk about something much more important. Football, right? In football, there is a hierarchy. You have your head coach and under that head coach, you have the uh, offensive coordinator and the defensive coordinator. And underneath them, you have the quarterback's coach and so on and so forth. We have this hierarchy, these levels of organization from simple to complex. And the same thing is true for our uh, body as well, right? What is the simplest level we can study the body at? Okay, Adam. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely, at a chemical level. Oops, that's my spell, right? Um. Right. The simplest and most basic level we can study the body is at is at the chemical level, right? Where we talk about atoms and molecules. If you put a bucket of chemicals together, what do you get? A reaction. True, and that is a reaction. But but if you if you put enough of those reactions together in a special way, what is the next level of our hierarchy up from the chemical level? Is it the cells? Compound. Cells. There you go. Absolutely. You're right. Molecules can form compounds and things along those lines. But really, when we're talking about our hierarchy, what we're really talking about is the cellular level of our hierarchy. And one of the key differences between our chemical level and our cellular level is our chemical, uh, pardon me, our cellular level, yeah. the first level where we can talk about life. All right? What it means to be alive. How do we define life? How do we tell something is alive? Reproduction. Excellent. One of the major factors is reproduction. What else? Metabolism. I'm sorry, say again. Metabolism. Metabolism. Yeah. Yep. Being able to do chemical reactions. What else? Give me at least one more. Nucleus. Well, but not necessarily all living things have a nucleus, but what does that nucleus allow us to do? Okay. Well, it allows us to make proteins, right? It allows us to grow, allows us to respond to our environment, things along those lines. Those are all characteristics that we think of when we think of in terms of life. 
right? We don't talk about water as being alive or carbon as being alive. Those are lungs. When you take those chemicals and you put them together in just the right order, you get cells, you get life. Those cells we just put together then to make our next level. And what's the next level? Organs. No, before Tissue. organs, but one more first. Tissues. Tissue. Tissue level, excellent. Right? Now, if I just have a bucket of cells, do I necessarily have a tissue? No. They have to be structured. Right, exactly. They have to, what we have to have is we have to have cells that, and here's the key word, that are similar in structure and or function. Notice they don't have to be identical, but they have to be similar in either structure or in function. And if they're similar in structure and or function, then they form a tissue. We then take tissues to form, and someone said it before, but I'll ask for it again. What do we form with tissues? Organs. There you go. Organ level. Now, if I have a big sheet of muscle tissue and I slap another sheet of muscle tissue on top of that, do I suddenly have an organ? No, no. it has to be different tissues that are working together uh, for a similar function or really similar goal in this case, right? And how many different tissues do I actually need to make an organ? Two. There you go, absolutely. It can be two or more. But uh, you can have as few as two, right? What's the largest organ of your body? Skin. There you go, absolutely skin. Yeah, I saw a couple of the boys adjusting their pants, but no, it is your skin is your largest organ. And wow. that organ, for the most part, the skin is primarily made up of two types of tissues. Right, so it's, it's basically just two types of tissue. So you have two or more different tissues working together and you get a similar goal, right? You put organs together to make what? Systems. There you go, organ systems. And remind me again, how many organ systems do we have in the human body? A lot. That's my school. A lot, it it's not a bad answer, but we might be able to get a little bit more precise than that. Is it 11? Six. It is indeed 11. I heard the right answer. Uh, it's okay if you don't know that yet. We will identify and talk about those a little bit later. Oh, God, my spelling is horrible. Ignore my spelling on these things. I'm not one of those people who can walk and chew gum at the same time, so trying to talk and type and uh, everything else at the same time is brutal, but you guys get the idea. You take those 11 organ systems and you put them together and what do you get? Organisms. An organism or an individual. Right, you get an individual and organism. All right. Now, for this class, where we want to spend most of our time is here and here. This is the fun stuff. This is where we want to spend most of our time. The problem with this, as we talked about, is it's a hierarchy. To understand organs and organ systems, we have to know something about tissues. To understand tissues, we need to know something about cells. And to understand cells, unfortunately, we need to understand a little something about chemistry as well. So what we're gonna be doing during the first two weeks is basically building this foundation. Quite frankly, it is an unfair task to ask of you. Because what we're going to do over the next two weeks is form the entire foundation, not just for everything you're going to be doing in 430, but everything you're going to do in 431 as well. Because after these first two weeks, for the rest of this class and for all of 431, we're going to be talking about organs and organ systems, and we're going to talk about the tissues that make them up and the cells that make them up and the chemical reactions that are taking place. So we have to build that foundation and we're going to do it rapidly so that we can do all the fun stuff, talking about organs and organ systems. Now, I do have one more question. Can our hierarchy continue to go up? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Individuals can form families, right? Uh, or clans or things along those lines, right? At that point, you're talking more sociology, 
you're no longer in anatomy and physiology. But if you think about it, absolutely, families, clans, populations, cities, countries, absolutely, you can continue up from there. But like I said, our goal is to stay down here. Once you get up there, you're no longer in anatomy and physiology. All right. And so again, I've done an amazing job of drawing that on the board with my uh, talented skills. But like I said, any good textbook worth its salt has some of these. And here we see the pretty picture from your textbook with all these levels as well. So again, our goal is to be here at the Oregon and Oregon system level, but we have to build that foundation first. All right. Now, again, we've barely started. I don't know about you, but I'm already exhausted. Uh, and I do feel kind of bad that this is so scary. Now, again, normally this would be the point where I'd invite everybody over for milk and cookies. Uh, you can't come into the house anymore, but I will be outside with bags of cookies uh, and uh, hermetically sealed uh, gallons of milk for everybody uh, to be able to come to and get milk and cookies from me. And there's your information. So based on this, we get done with the class around 1235. How many people should I expect to be at my house by, say, one? Oh, everybody. With that. Everybody, based on what I've drawn here? <laughs> How many people are going to make it by one, do you think? None. Zero. Yeah, none. none. Why not? I've given you an excellent map. Look, that even looks like my house. There's no specifics. Right, absolutely. There's no specificity. There's no directional terms. There's no location terms. There's no street names. There's no information. One of the challenges really with biology, but particularly when you're doing genetics, particularly when you're doing anatomy and physiology, is it is like learning a new language. Because the deal is when you have a problem and your doctor calls another doctor who's across the country and they need to talk in a meaningful way where they can describe what is going on in you and they both understand and they can both discuss and they can both come up with a regional, with a, uh, with a rational plan of how to deal with it. And so they need their own vocabulary. And the same way that this map by itself doesn't do anything because there's no reference, we need a standard reference point. And that reference point is the anatomical position. The first thing we need to get started on anything else is we need a map. That map of the body or that globe, right? You have that globe. Once we have that globe, that globe helps us to understand the difference between Africa and South America. It helps us to understand the difference between Canada and the United States, between California and Nevada, and so on and so forth. You need a map. That has to be our starting point. And in anatomy and physiology, that map is called anatomical position. Regardless of the position of your patient when you're dealing with a person, right? You walk up and they're curled up in a ball on the ground. They're chopped up into pieces and spread across the lawn. Right? Whatever their position is, we always assume the body is in anatomical position. And anatomical position looks a little something like this. You're standing upright, facing forward, feet are pointing forward. The arms are slightly to the side and the palms are facing forward. We always assume anatomical position uh, when we are talking about the body. This is our globe. And once you have a globe, you can start talking about directions and locations, right? And again, that starts as simple as this. Is this the left arm or the right arm? Right. Right. Yeah, it may be on your left side as you look at it, but we always assume the, student, the, the, the patient's position. So this is this person's right arm. All right. Once we have a map, we can start talking about regional terms. Now, as I mentioned, one of the things that I uh, talked about is that I love about this class is that this class is hard. And so it's very straightforward. If we spend a whole hour and a half of lecture talking about something and you have a physio X about that concept, that's probably a pretty important concept and probably gonna be likely to be an essay question on the exam. This is the one exception. This right here, your regional terms is one of the most important things you can learn and, and is going to be probably close to 20% of your lab exam. 
but we're only going to look at it for about a minute here, less than a minute. This is vitally important and you need to learn it now, right? Because these are terms we're going to be using it over and over again, right? What's the term for this thigh region? If you're not sure, you can always follow the lead. There you go. Femoral region, excellent. That is the femoral region of the body. There happens to be a blood vessel, an artery that passes through this region. Guess what it's called? Femoral artery. There you go. There happens to be a bone located in this region. Guess what it's called? Femur. There you go. There happens to be a large muscle group located in this region. Guess what it's called? Five. Hamstring. Now, hamstring's on the back, actually. The hamstring is back here. The one here is the quadriceps. Yeah. But it's the quadriceps femoris. Uh, One of the muscles of the quadriceps femoris is the rectus femoris, right? There's the femoral nerve. And again and again, all of these things are going to be vitally important, right? Where do you put your Axe body spray? In the trash. In the trash. In the trash. Okay, but if you okay, if someone were to wear Axe body spray, where would they put it? Your thoracic region. No, well, okay, sure, the thoracic region, but where is axillary? Axillary region, the armpit. Right. Where do you think it got its name? Axe body spray goes into the axillary oh, region of the God. body. <laughs> right. So again, these terms are things we're going to use again and again in a class, and you need to know them now. All right, there are pictures in your textbook. There are pictures in your lab manual. Notice I have not given you a study guide list of this because you need to know all of them. It would be redundant for me to write this all out again. So I'm not gonna waste the time to write them all out again for you. You need to know all of them and you need to know them now. And like I said, they could easily be as much as 20% of your lab exam, your first lab exam. So it's important to know these now. Knowing the names of things is important. Knowing where Canada is, knowing where the United States is, knowing where Vegas is, all of these are things that are important. But knowing how to get there is important as well. Knowing things like north and south and east and west, having these directional terms are things that are important as well. So once you have regions, you can relate those regions to each other, right? So that I could identify two structures here, like say for instance, your eyes, and your nose and if i were to give you those two uh, parts of your body and ask you to identify the relationship of them you would say the eyes are what in relation to the nose superior superior absolutely superior <laughs> would be a perfectly acceptable answer for that and notice like most of these terms they come in pairs so I could say that the eyes are superior to the nose, or I could say the nose is inferior, inferior. to the eyes, all right? Is there another term we could have put in there as well? Distal. Yeah. No, distal wouldn't necessarily be the right one. Whoops, hold on. Away from the heart? Well, but we don't wanna add a third structure yet. So the eyes are what in relation to the nose? Lateral? There you go, another answer would be lateral. Oops, sorry, spell it right. Or we could say the nose is medial to the eyes, right? What does it mean to be medial? Towards the midline of the body. Towards the midline of the body, absolutely. And lateral then is away from the midline. <laughs> Superior is to the top of the body, inferior is to the bottom of the body, right? So we're starting to get these north, south, east, and wests. All right, let's do uh, two other ones instead, or let's talk about some other terms here instead. Anterior and posterior. What does anterior mean? Front. Towards the front, and posterior is to the back, where your posterior is, right? But here's one of the challenges with anatomy and physiology. One of the important rules you need to learn about anatomy and physiology is that anatomists hate you. One of the ways they do this is they make rules and then they break those rules. So that's one thing that they do that is uh, troubling. The other thing is, is the problem is that it's such a broad field that um, people talk 
in, in different parts of anatomy and physiology, they have their own dialects, their own subcultures of the language. And so there are often numerous terms that mean the exact same thing. There are two other terms on this list that mean the exact same thing as anterior and posterior. And what are they? Let's start easy. What term on this list means exactly, hold on, let's change the color of that. What on this list means the exact same thing as posterior? Dorsal. Dorsal, absolutely. Dorsal and posterior are completely interchangeable terms. Now, there are some times where they're used, and here's another important word to learn, or phrase to learn, by convention. By convention means that it's just a rule these anatomists have kind of made up. When we talk about, for instance, the nervous system, one of the things we'll talk about is there is a cluster of cell bodies on the back of the spinal cord, and it's called the dorsal root ganglion. And almost everybody calls it the dorsal root ganglion. But would it be acceptable to call it the posterior root ganglion? Yeah, because they're completely interchangeable terms. So posterior and dorsal mean the exact same thing. The same thing is also true for anterior. What's the term that means the exact same thing as anterior? Caudal? No, nope, I thought that's a really good guess, but no. Nope. Ventral. Ventral and anterior mean the exact same thing. So these words are completely interchangeable. These words are completely interchangeable. Oh, okay. Now, you guys are correct in that cephalic and caudal are similar to anterior and posterior. In reality, cephalic means towards the head. And caudal means towards the tail. Oops. And that can kind of sometimes mean anterior and posterior, but also, and again, with my horrible drawing skills, we'll just quickly draw a head here. Let me cheat. Let's do this first. Hide that for a second, and that will allow me to draw a head. And on that head, I'll put a nose and an eyeball and a smile. There we go. So, the so, phallic means towards the head, but it can also mean towards the front of the head. So, for instance, for a, um, in when we're talking about the nervous system, cephalic means towards the front of the head, whereas caudal means towards the back of the head. So notice in that case, it's not superior and it's not, uh, you know, anterior, pardon me, it's not superior and inferior, it's more like anterior and posterior, right? So again, we have these terms that are similar, but uh, not identical. Whereas anterior and ventral are identical, posterior and dorsal are identical. All right? And it gets even more fun than that. Mm. Oh, I need to put... Hold on, let's do that back. Actually, no, never mind. Let's cheat and erase this again for a second. Oh no, I can't do that. Because the term I want are there. Okay, hold on. See, this is the problem with doing this for the first time and like this. I don't know how to play. <laughs> there we go. All right, excellent. Okay, so let's go two more terms. Based on what we've learned so far, how do you think you would relate the knee to the ankle? What is the knee in relation to the ankle? The knee is superior to the ankle. Superior would seem to work, right? Or maybe even cephalic so, towards the head. The problem is that's not right. So it seems like it should be right, right? Uh, like that should be a correct answer, but it turns out we can't use superior and inferior when we're talking about the appendages. 
when we're talking about the appendages, like the knee or the ankle, or if we're talking about the arm, for instance, the elbow. There you go. Elbow and the wrist. The term we would use in this case would be proximal. Proximal means towards the core of the body. Or we could turn it around and say the wrist is what in relation to the elbow? Distal. Distal, absolutely. Distal, yeah. yeah, so those are dist proximal and distal. Mm -hmm. Proximal and distal are used on the appendages, the arms and the legs. So even though superior looks like it might work, superior and inferior would work, it actually doesn't. All right? The other thing we can do is we could add a third component to this. Let's sneak this down. We have our elbow, we have our wrist, and then we have our shoulder. Well, based on what we've learned so far, our shoulder would be what? Proximal. Proximal, there you go. Our wrist would be? Distal. Distal. So then what does that make our elbow? Uh, lateral. Well, if you think about anatomical position, actually the wrist is lateral to the shoulder. So, but so it, it, this is proximal for the wrist, but distal for the shoulder. How, how can we condense that into one word? Like an in-between word. Intermediate. There you go. Yeah. Intermediate. Intermediate. There you go. All right. Uh, I got a question. Yes. Um, so would you not use proximal or distal for anything but the appendages? Correct. Proximal and distal are just on the appendages. So just the arms and the legs. Yeah, so something on the body would either be medial or lateral, closer to the center of the body or further from the body, or superior or inferior. Let's up and down. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Let's do two more. Heart and ribs. What is your heart in relation to your ribs? Um, are superior? No. Some of them are, but are all the, yeah, is the heart no, superior yeah. to all of them? No. Would it be deep? There you go, absolutely. The key word here would be deep. Right. If your heart is not deep to the ribs, please see a doctor immediately. Right. <laughs> Again, some part of the ribs are in front of it, some part of the ribs are behind of it, some part of the ribs are lateral to it. So none of those are really the right answer, but what we do have here is deep. Right. And again, notice we can say that the heart is indeed deep. We have the ribs, but then if we put the skin, That's then our skin would be what? Superficial. Superficial. Our uh, heart would be deep. And what does that make our ribs? Intermediate. Intermediate again. Excellent. Notice intermediate, not medial. Medial means towards the midline. Medial and intermediate are not the same thing. Intermediate means in between. Now, again, I know I appreciate for most of you, these terms are pretty intuitive, pretty straightforward. There are a couple that can be tricky, so let's talk about those. Starting first with prone and supine. As we mentioned, we always assume anatomical position, but the body always in, isn't in anatomical position. So what position would the body be in if the body was prone? On its belly. There you go, on its belly, like you were getting ready to do a push-up or getting ready to plank. And if the body was supine? On your back. On your back, like you're getting ready to do a pull, uh, you know, a sit up or a crunch or something like that. Excellent. So those are pretty good. That only leaves us with two others: contralateral and ipsilateral. <laughs> what does contralateral and ipsilateral mean? Let's start with ipsilateral. Any idea what ipsilateral means? Same side mm -hmm. of the body. Excellent. Same side of the body. Contralateral and ipsilateral are used, uh, directional terms, but they're often used in the nervous system, 
right? If you think about it, if I put my hand on something hot, what happens is I get a signal that goes up my arm to my spinal cord, tells me that I'm feeling something painful, and it sends a signal back to my arm to pull my arm away before I even know I should be cursing. <laughs> notice, it, notice in that pathway, the, all the information stays on one side of my body. However, as many of you know, if I wanna wave my left hand at you, where do I make that decision? Right. The right side of the brain. Notice mm -hmm. I start with that information on the right side of the brain, it comes down and it crosses the midline to tell my left hand what to do. So information or paths that cross the midline are contralateral. Contralateral crosses the midline from one side to another. All right, now, a great way to study this, and I know a lot of you are stuck at home and a lot of you have kids, so a great way to practice this is to practice this with your kids. Take a paintbrush, make it wet, and pick two parts of the body. Take the left, you know, anticubital region, and give driving directions to the right popliteal region. And so basically what you can do with that weight, take paintbrush, is start in the left antecubital region, move proximally to the brachial region, move proximally to the axillary region, move uh, you know, medially to the thoracic, medially to the sternal, uh, contralateral to the, uh, you know, lateral contralaterally to the left thoracic and so on and so forth. You should be able to give driving directions using these directional terms, using these regional terms from one part of the body to another. It's a great way to learn this material. It's a fun interactive way to get your kids involved in it. And again, this is gonna be a huge part of your first exam. We need to know these terms and we need to know them now. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent, stunned silence, I love it. Excellent, and a book, of course, your book has a table that helps with all of these as well. Now, using a paintbrush to draw on the surface of the body to get from one place to another is a fun way to study the body, but eventually we have to open it up and look on the inside. And there are four planes of section. And a plane of section, of course, is what divides the body into two pieces. What is one of the ways we can divide the body into two pieces? What would the two pieces be? Left and right. Left and right, excellent. We can cut into a left and right pieces. If we were to do that, what type of section of the body would that be? Anybody know? If I were to cut the body into a left side and a right side, what kind of, anyone know what we call that kind of plane of section? you're too shy to say it out loud, you can always type it in the chat window if you need to. It's a sagittal section. Sagittal. Yeah, it is a sagittal section that cuts the body into left pieces and right pieces. How many different sagittal sections of the body can you make? Two? <clears throat> Two? Four? Can we do, is it going to have anything to do with anterior and posterior? Well, no, in this case, well, again, if you think about it, that is a different way we can cut the body. We'll come back to that one in just a second. But when we're talking about sagittal sections, we have a left piece and a right piece. How many different ways can we cut the body where we get a left piece and a right piece? Two. Three. Two, three. As are close. Five. Five. Keep going. <laughs> Eight. Keep going. 17. How about infinite? Oh, There's an infinite number. Think about it. If I cut off my right thumb, do I have a right piece and a left piece? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so if you think about an anatomical position, every step along the way, there's essentially an infinite number of sections that can be made. However, 
with those infinite number of sections, is there one particular section that will give me two pieces that are equal and opposite to each other? The obvious answer is yes. Anyone know what that special section is called? Right on the midline? Well, it's called a mid-sagittal or a median section. That special section divides the body. Oops. What? You? To equal and opposite pieces. All right. So we have that mid-sagittal section, which is a single section. All the other sections don't make equal pieces. And so those we refer to as para sagittal. So there's an infinite number of parasagittal sections, but only one mid-sagittal mid or median section. Now, someone also mentioned front and back pieces. Of course, we should put those in quotes because front and back are no longer appropriate anatomical terms. And thankfully, our student actually used the right terms, and that was anterior and posterior, nor my spelling. What kind of a section is it if we make it into anterior and posterior pieces? This one you should know. Isn't it frontal plane? One term for it is indeed a frontal plane of section. However, there is another name for it. Uh, because if you think about it, if you cut yourself into a front piece and a back transverse? piece, it's like putting a crown on your head. And as we all now know, what is the term for crown? Coronal? Coronal section. There you go. So either a frontal section uh, plane, or let's be consistent with the terms, frontal section or a coronal section. How many coronal sections can you make of the body? These questions should be getting easier. <laughs> well, if I cut off the very tip of my nose, do I have a front piece and a back piece? Yes. And then if I cut off half my nose, do I have a front piece and a back piece? Yes. And all of my nose, do I have a front piece and back piece? Yes. So how many possible coronal sections can I have? Infinite. Infinite, exactly. An infinite number of sections. Now, remember, there is a special sagittal section that gives us equal and opposite pieces. With a frontal, is there a section that gives us equal and opposite? Does the front of you look like the back of you? No. 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 So there is no special section for that one. Right, only the sagittal has the section, the special section. All right, we have left and right, we have front and back. What does that leave us with? Top and bottom. There you go. And we'll again put that in quotes. Because again, we want to use correct anatomical terms. So those would be correct anatomical terms for top and bottom. Superior. There you go. Superior and inferior. Excellent. <clears throat> what kind of section is that? That cuts us into a top piece and a bottom piece. Transverse. There you go. Transverse or what is also known as a cross section. And again, whoops, spelling. And again, let's try to be consistent. Transverse section. and a cross section. And how many number of transverse sections can you take of the body? The number of sections. All right, you take off what's left of my hair, that'd be a top piece and a bottom piece, or the bunions from the bottom of my feet, and that'd be a top piece and a body piece and anything in between. And does the top part of you look like the bottom part of you? No, so there's no special section for that as well. All right. I've done it here with words. 
but let's take a look with the pretty picture. And here with the pretty picture from your textbook, you can see those three main planes of sections that we talked about, a frontal, a transverse, and a sagittal. And notice they're all right angles to each other. In fact, there's a special term for these. These are called the cardinal planes of section because they are all right angles to each other. All right. Any questions on any of that? No. Repeat that part. I didn't get the cardinal. So the, the transverse, the frontal, and the sagittal are called the cardinal planes of section because if you notice, they're all right angles from each other. So all of them are right angles, 90 degree angles from each other, giving us perfect 90 degree angles when cutting through the bar. Gotcha. All right. So any other questions on that? Is there a reason why it says four planes? I was hoping somebody would catch that. Yes, absolutely. There is exactly a reason because there is a fourth plane of section. These are the cardinal planes of section, but think about it. If you were dissecting a body, would you have to cut it perfectly at these 90 degree angles? No, maybe what you want to see, you need to cut at an angle or maybe we need to see the shoulder. So we need to take off something like this, right? So we have those three cardinal planes of section, and then we have all these angular sections. Any angular section that is not on one of those cardinal planes, what is the special word for that type of section? You know? Cross? No, nope, it's called oblique, an oblique section. So any section that is not on one of those cardinal planes is what is known as an oblique section, and that is the fourth plane of section. So our fourth plane of section oops, is what we call an oblique section, and that would be any angled plane that wasn't one of the cardinal planes. So that is why there are four main planes of section, sagittal, frontal, transverse, and oblique. All right, questions on that? All right, this information is important because uh, when we cut the body open, right, we're kind of like an Easter bunny, right? We're all chocolate on the outside, but we're hollow on the inside. We have all these spaces, and these spaces contain important stuff. And so we need to make sections of the body to see that stuff. And those stuff is located in spaces, and those spaces are known as our body cavities. As I mentioned, one of the keys to this class is vocabulary, right? Uh, I will be very precise in my wording of my questions and I expect you to be equally precise in your answering them. When we talk about body cavities, we can talk about general cavities and we can talk about specific. And when we talk about these terms, and really, we don't even have to put cavities in here. We can just talk in general about general and specific. These are terms that I will be using on the lab exam to give you a, a more precise definition of what it is that I'm looking for. General, as the name indicates, tends to be the larger things, right? Uh, so like, for instance, in general, you live in North America, right? More specific than that, right, would be the United States of America, or more specific than that would be California, or more specific than that would be Sacramento, or whatever it is, right? So general and specific are key terms. And here, when we are talking about our body cavities, at first we will talk about the general body cavities. And there are two. The first is your dorsal body cavity. That dorsal body cavity, as the name would indicate, is on the back, the dorsal side. And that dorsal body cavity, that general body cavity, has two specific cavities inside of it. One of those specific cavities is the cranial cavity. 
Guess what contains the what? Guess what is contained inside of the cranial cavity? Brain. Your brain. And what forms your cranial cavity? Skull. Yeah, the bones of the skull. Absolutely, bones of the skull form the cranial cavity, and that cranial cavity contains the brain. The second specific cavity of the dorsal body cavity is the vertebral or spinal cavity. And guess what it contains? Spinal cord. Spinal cord, excellent. And what forms it? A spinal nerve. Vertebrae? Vertebrae. There you go. It's the vertebrae that forms it. Absolutely. The vertebrae form the cavity that contains the spinal cord. All right? And here we have a pretty picture that actually does a job of showing this. Hmm. So here, all in yellow is the general cavity, which is the dorsal body cavity. This specific cavity up here is the cranial cavity. This specific uh, cavity here is the spinal cavity. As I said, my goal in this class is not to be tricky, but we are gonna be very precise with this information. And I will be very careful in the vocabulary that I use when uh, asking questions on the exam. And I expect you to be equally careful in your answering of them. So if this was the first picture on the lab exam, and I have those two arrows, arrow one and arrow two, and I ask you to, for uh, question one was, identify the general cavity indicated by tag number one. What would your answer be? Dorsal. 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 Remember, I asked for general cavity. If I asked for the general cavity of question two, is your answer the same or is your answer different? Same. Same. So notice if I, for this, for this uh, example, if I asked you for the general cavity, the answer to both is going to be the same. But what if instead I asked you for the specific cavity? Would the answers be the same then? No. No, they would not be the same. Right. One, the specific cavity one would be? Cranial. Cranial, and specific for number two would be? Spinal. Spinal or vertebral, excellent, right? One of the things that I, again, I say it in the classroom. I don't know how I'm going to say it to you guys here. I guess I'll have to try to remind you by email or something like that. But one of the things that I constantly try to point out to students is that students often lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the question carefully. Hmm. If I ask you to give me the general cavity indicated by tag number two, and you say vertebral, you are providing correct information. Number two is pointing to the vertebral cavity. The problem is, did you answer my question? No. I asked for the general cavity and you gave me vertebral. Is that a general cavity? No. No. You could actually argue you're giving me more information that I'm asking for. You're answering the harder question. The problem is you didn't answer my question. And if you don't answer the question I ask, I can't give you full credit. Even if you give me a correct answer, two is pointing at the vertebral uh, uh, cavity, but it's not the question I asked. I asked for the general cavity. That's a perfect example where people obviously know the information, but they don't read the question carefully. You don't answer it correctly. You got to read the questions carefully. You're going to have plenty of time to read the questions and answer them correctly. So please read them carefully. Every test, there's numerous instances where people lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the question carefully. And that's one of the tricks to this, right? Let's ignore this one for a second, All right? One of the reasons I'm so specific with my wording of the questions is because often with an arrow like this, there are two, three, four different questions, half a dozen questions I could ask. 
if you think about this particular question with that particular arrow, if you think about the questions I already asked, I could ask you the general body cavity. I could ask you the specific body cavity. I could ask you what is contained within this cavity. I could ask you what forms this cavity. Notice right there, just from what we've talked about on this slide so far, there are four questions I could ask you with that same picture and that same arrow. And all four of those are likely to be essay questions on the exam, or I mean, not essay questions, likely to be questions on your lab exam. So what happens is people see that arrow and they get all excited. I know what that is. That's a cranial cavity and they write cranial cavity down. But you didn't read the question and maybe I was asking for what's contained in there. So it is really important to read the questions carefully. Again, I'm telling you this because my, I'm not trying to be tricky. My goal is not to be tricky. My goal is to be precise. I am going to ask you for specific pieces of information and you need to give me those specific pieces of information. Does that make sense? All right, excellent. All right, so this is just one of many examples. And again, I will always try to be uh, clear and apparent in what I'm saying so that it makes sense when you guys are looking at these things. I, I try to be very systematic, very standard in my wording so that I can be very precise and you can be equally precise in your answers. I'll use terms like general cavity and specific cavity, right, so that you know exactly what it is that I'm looking for. And notice as we peek ahead, we had we also far we've just talked about this yellow cavity, but lo and behold, there is a red cavity as well. That red cavity is the again general cavity. Is the ventral body cavity. And that ventral body cavity has uh, this is where it gets a little trickier. Um, four and a half specific cavities inside of it. Let's talk about that and see why this one's a little bit trickier. Our ventral body cavity, and again, notice we've used the term dorsal cavity and ventral cavity. What else could we use instead? Posterior, anterior. Exactly. Posterior and anterior would be perfectly acceptable. If I asked you what this yellow thing was and you said posterior body cavity, that would be 100% correct. All right. Now, let's start easy. With our ventral body cavity, our ventral body cavity is divided anatomically into two specific cavities. Now that takes a little definition. What do I mean by divided anatomically? Divided by the diaphragm and the pelvis. Perfect, well not just the pelvis, but you got the right idea. Divided anatomically, what we actually mean is there is actually a physical structure that separates the two cavities. And as you correctly uh, identified, that structure is the diaphragm. So notice here, if we look at the pretty picture, you actually have a curved bell-shaped muscle, a physical structure that separates the ventral body cavity into the thoracic and I'm no pelvic. Body cavity. Notice abdominal pelvic is all one word. So we have a physical barrier that makes sure that things that are in your thoracic cavity stay in your thoracic cavity. Things that are in your abdominal pelvic cavity stay in your abdominal pelvic cavity. Right? If your small intestine gets up here into your thoracic cavity, see a doctor immediately. All right. Now, these thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities can be further divided oh. and let's start easy. Our abdominal pelvic body cavity can be divided into how many cavities? Two. Two, absolutely. What are they? Abdomen and pelvic. Yeah, there you go. 
abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. It's kind of in the name. However, notice there is not an anatomical structure. This is the picture is a little tricky because it does kind of show this structure here, but there isn't actually a physical structure. What they're trying to show is the bones of the pelvis, the true pelvis. Uh, the pelvis forms a bowl-like structure, but it doesn't form a boundary the same way that the diaphragm does. So this whole entire space can be further divided into the abdominal pelvic, uh, abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity, uh, but there isn't an anatomical structure that divides it as well. And the same thing is true in our thoracic body cavity. Our thoracic body cavity can be divided as well. Anybody know how many spaces it can be divided into? Four quadrants. True. Well, quadrants are actually coming back, back down into here. We'll talk about quadrants when we talk about the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we, you are correct. Uh, when we, with the abdominal pelvic cavity, because the abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity aren't as useful, we will talk not just about quadrants, uh, but we will also talk about regions when we talk about the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we will do that. And you are right. There are four quadrants and there are actually nine regions. So we will come back to that. But let's talk about the thoracic cavity first. Oh, I'm thoracic sorry, five lobes, or sorry, yeah, five lobes. Close, you're right, the lungs have five lobes. And so you're right, the lungs do have, a. there is a space associated with the lungs. And that space associated with the lungs is the left pleural cavity and the right Plural cavity. Plural refers to lungs. But there's also a space in between. Anybody know what the space in between these are called? Peeked ahead at the lecture notes. Mediastinum. And inside the mediastinum is where we have our uh, pericardial cavity. Sometimes it's easier if we see these things. So let's look at a pretty picture. I've got all of these. We did that. We'll talk about that in a second. Ah, this helps. So when we're talking about the organs of the ventral body cavity, all the squishy, gushy organs in here are known as the viscera, visceral organs. And if we look up here at the thoracic cavity, the thoracic cavity is actually divided into three regions. All right here we see it from this view, but let's look at it from this view. And one of the tricks to this class is we have to get used to peering at the body from different points of view. All right, so I want you to all bring up your chat screen right now. Actually, hold on, let me see, I haven't ever done this before. Let me see. Uh, that's too much work. I know. I'll have to set that up ahead of time. Um, so here's what I want you to do. In your chat window, we are looking at this. First, tell me what plane of section is this? Type it into your chat screen. What plane of, sec what plane of section? Transverse. Absolutely. Excellent. This is a transverse one. All right. We got one. That's good. Now, all of you have to do this one. The view that you are looking at here, is this a superior view or an inferior view? Wondering. So, right, what's your answer? Is it superior or inferior? Inferior, inferior, superior. Excellent, looks like it's about two to one being, oh, now Superior is making a strong comeback here. Excellent, all right, perfect. It's a good mix, almost 50-50. So let's figure this out, right? If we think about this, the, what we wanna do is orient ourselves on this person's body. This subject whose section, this transverse section we are looking at, are they in a prone or are they in a supine position? Excellent. This is a supine person. Oops. So that means they're laying on their back. So then the question is, as you look at their screen, 
are their feet out the screen and their head sitting here in front of you, or is their head behind the screen and their feet in front of you? You have to figure that out by looking at where the right lung is. The right lung to be on the right, on the left side as we look at it, is their head behind the screen or is their head in front of the screen? Excellent, their head is behind the screen. So what that means is we have cut them in half, tipped them down, and if you notice, we are looking at this from an inferior view. So this would be like we were looking at them from beneath. This is an inferior view. All right. One of the things you need to do is get used to orienting yourself to the body, getting used to looking at the body from different points of view. So that you should be able to look at a section like this and be able to figure out how it is that you're looking at the body. All right. One of the important tasks we need to be able to do for this class. But now that we've gotten that out of the way, we can talk more about these cavities, these spaces inside of our thoracic cavity. Notice first, as we look at them, here we see a cavity and here we see a cavity. Both of these are associated with the lungs. So as we talked about, these are plural cavities and notice they don't connect. You may not have thought of it in these terms, but I know you're probably aware of it. There you are Friday night at the bar, right? Back in the old days when we could go to bars, right? And getting into deep philosophical discussions at that bar as you normally do, like who is the cutest member of One Direction, right? And as you're having these discussions, they often get heated, right? Some people incorrectly think it's hairy, and that's clearly, clearly not the case. Right, and so instead, right, big rumbles come up and knives come out and you get a knife in the chest. And that lung collapses as the blood and air gets into that space. Do you necessarily die because of that? You can't inflate one lung? No, because the other is individually shrink wrapped and will stay uh, inflated uh, until the paramedics get there and take you away. So we have a right plural cavity and a left plural cavity. But notice we have this yellow region in between and this yellow region in between is that mediastinum. This mediastinum in here is where things like the esophagus, things like the uh, uh, aorta is located, inferior, uh, sorry, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, things like that are located in this space. But notice also in the mediastinum, there is a location where the heart sits. And notice the heart also has a cavity around it as well. That's why I kind of meant half. Because within this mediastinum, we have an even more specific space. And that more specific space is the pericardial cavity. Yes, Ryan, you had a question. Um, so the knee... <laughs> what was the cavity for the heart again? The cavity for the heart is the pericardial cavity, yeah, and it is located cavity. within the mediastinum. Of right. the okay, yeah, sorry. Gosh, sorry. Um, so that's totally enclosed. Are the pleural cavities not totally enclosed? Like the they are part? totally enclosed as well, absolutely. It has an but, open part towards the mediastinum. I guess. But, true, uh, but at, well, what actually happens here, that's actually a great question. The, the anatomy of this is not quite specific. What actually happens is, uh, let me get a drawing tool. Um, this is where the blood vessels and the bronchi and mm. nerves and things like that connect to the lung. Okay. Gotcha. So what happens is, uh, and this is one of the things we're going to be talking about next. If you notice, what we have here are some membranes that are wrapping around these organs. And again, the general term uh, for these membranes are serous membranes, or again, serous is the adjective that describes it. So if we wanted to use the noun, the rosa. And these serous membranes wrap around these organs. So if we look closely, what you'll see is there is a serous membrane that wraps around the heart and a serous membrane that forms a cavity and that forms our pericardial cavity. Our lung has a serous membrane on its surface and one that forms a cavity. And then the space in between is the pleural cavity. The same thing is true on the right and the same thing is true on the right. Notice the mediastinum doesn't have a serous membrane by itself. 
but it does contain the pericardial uh, serous membrane inside of it. All right. Uh, yes, there are two more questions. Or another, somebody else raised their hand? Yeah, I cool. raised my hand. Yeah, um, Nicole, yes. Could you explain um, why this view is, or why we know that this person is um, like supine, like on their back? Because anterior, because this says anterior here and that says posterior here. Yeah. Now, as we get more comfortable with the body, we will learn that the vertebrae are on your back, right? Which again, oh. if, you, if you think about it with a little kid, you can kind of, I mean, it doesn't have to be a little kid, anybody. You can feel the bumps of their spine on the back. So yeah. we know the, the vertebral column are there. The heart is towards the front. This is actually the sternum, although it's not labeled. But the fact that we have the anterior and posterior labeled there are the, are the dead giveaway. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yep. Great questions. Any others? All right, so here we have these spaces inside of the thoracic cavity. And here we have, again, in a flow chart that kind of shows this organization as well. So again, we have the abdominal cavity, the pelvic cavity, the left and right pleural cavities, the mediastinum, which then also contains the pericardial cavity. All right. Now, for the abdominal pelvic cavity, as was mentioned, abdominal pelvic is useful. Abdominal and pelvic are useful, but there aren't anatomical uh, dividers. So instead, as we talked about, when talking about the portions of the abdominal pelvic cavity, we can talk about them in terms of quadrants. And there are four quadrants. As you can see very technical terms, right upper, left upper, right lower, left lower. So very, very technical terms for those. Or we can talk instead, right? And notice to get your quadrants, you draw a vertical line through the belly button, a horizontal line through the belly button, and you get your quadrants. If instead you want to play tic-tac-toe, we get our nine regions. And these nine regions are a little bit more technical in their naming. But one of the nice things about this, and again, this is one of those things where your medical terminology class can be helpful is often when you have these alphabet soup terms, the names tell you everything about it. Epigastric. What is gastric referred to? Digestive. Yeah, and specifically the stomach. And what does epi mean? Does anyone know what epi means? Top. On top, above, there you go. Hypo means what? Okay, lower. Below. So hypogastric, below the stomach, epigastric, above the stomach. Hmm. Umbilical refers to your umbilical region, your belly button. Right? Hypochondriac. Now, normally when we think of the term hypochondriac, we think of that neighbor who always thinks they're sick. But what does hypochondriac actually mean? We know hypo. Hypo means what? Below. Below. Any idea what chondriac refers to? Chondro? Yes, yes, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it refers to the cartilage of the ribs. Mm. Chondro refers to the cartilage of the ribs. So hypochondriac little, really means below the ribs. Right? So again, the names often tell us what they are. All right? Now, again, that brings me to a couple of important points. First, as I mentioned, not only do you need to know these regions, but you also may, for instance, need to identify uh, the organs in a particular region. Like give me an example of an organ you would find in the right hypochondriac region. Anybody know an organ we might find up here? Your largest visceral organ? Liver. Liver. That'd be one of the places you would find the liver, absolutely. So I could ask you to identify that region. I could ask you to identify an organ or two organs or three organs that you would find in a region. All right. As I mentioned, the liver is our largest visceral organ. So another question I could ask you is to identify the quadrants that you would find the liver in. And what would your answer to that be? Right. Right, right, right. Hypochondriac, what else? The right lumbar region 
right lumbar Region. Yeah, umbilical region. Epigastric. Mm. Epigastric region. Is that good? Yep. Yep. And that is 100% wrong. Because the question I actually asked was what quadrant <laughs> did you find the liver in? Right. Right. right so upper. again, notice perfect example of how you guys actually gave me the harder answer. <laughs> Because what's the correct answer to the question? Upper right. Yeah, upper right. Yeah, maybe it sneaks over. Maybe it sneaks over into the upper left, right? It could actually sneak over into the upper left, right? But again, you guys showed good knowledge. You showed good information, but you didn't answer the question. I will say it again and again and again. People often lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the question carefully. Again, my goal is not to be tricky. My goal is to be precise. And I want you to be equally precise in your answers as well. Okay? Now, which region would you find the lungs in, the left lung in? The left hypochondriac region. Everybody agree with that? Now, in this case, I am being tricky, because remember, what is the uh, up, what is the superior boundary? What is the ceiling of the abdominal pelvic region? The diaphragm. Mm -hmm. The diaphragm, and our lung is up here, so our lung isn't in any of these uh, abdominal regions because it's not in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, that one I was purposely being tricky on for that one. Okay. Uh, that wouldn't be an essay question. I mean, I wouldn't be a question on the exam. But again, I want to emphasize that point. Remember, we have a superior boundary to the abdominal pelvic region, and that is that diaphragm. All right. Questions on that? Oh, and here's a pretty picture that shows this. Now, one last <laughs> thing I want to point out. Notice, for instance, if I asked you where the gallbladder is, notice this particular illustration shows the gallbladder in the umbilical region. Is that the only right answer? Is everybody's gallbladder in precisely this location? No. no. Some people's, it may be a little bit more superior. Some people, it may be a little bit more lateral. So really, if you gave me the answer of either of these, any of these four, I would accept that as a correct answer. However, is your gallbladder ever going to be in the left lumbar region? or the hypogastric region, right? Or the lower left quadrant, no. So again, there is some slush in this, but it's gonna be, you know, but it will be obvious what is and what is not. All right, one more important question. When we're talking about people losing points, uh, question one, identify this region, and what is the answer to that? The left lumbar. Right, or sorry, left upper region. Well, no, the region, remember uh, the region is the lumbar. And I heard, but I heard the key word I was looking for, left, right? I know it seems like a simple thing, but left and right is really important on these exams. If you just put lumbar region, you will get partial credit, all right? Think of it this way. If you're, the way I think of it is, it, as if, if it's important or not, is to think of it this way. If you're being wheeled in to have surgery on your knee, and the nurse just says to the doctor, they need a complete reconstruction of the knee, do you want him to guess which side he should do, flip a coin, pick whichever one he look, thinks looks nicer? <laughs> you want them to be precise about whether it's the left or right. Left and right matter. So make sure you put left and right on the exam. On the exam, if you just identified that as the lumbar region, you would only get partial credit for that. You need to make sure you specify left. So left and right is important on this exam, on all the exams. Okay? Questions on that? All right, excellent. Uh, where are we time-wise? I have been talking for a while. We still have a bit to go, but this is another good stopping point. I talked a little longer than I meant to. I uh, usually like to go for about an hour, and then I think usually that's a good time when we need a break, but this is a good natural stopping point because this next part is a little bit trickier because we're getting into more vocabulary. 
So let's go ahead and take a quick break for this one. We'll just take a quick 10 minute break. So come back at 11.05. And 11.05, we will pick up from there. Excellent, all right. All right, the last little, well actually the, 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 the last little major things that we need to talk about from our lecture standpoint is to come back to this concept that we've already started talking about, is that as we look at these two, um, oh, I lost all my tools, hold on a second. That one back. Bring that over there. All right. As we look at these two body cavities, um, they contain organs. Right, we're not like that chocolate Easter bunny where we're just hollow on the inside. We have these cavities, but they contain organs. And these organs need to be protected. So there are protective coverings that surround them. And the coverings for the dorsal body cavity and the coverings for the ventral body cavity are different. In the ventral, uh, pardon me, in the dorsal body cavity, uh, the brain and the spinal cord are covered by some protective membranes known as the meninges. Uh, there are actually three different uh, meninges, and we will talk about those and describe their anatomy in detail when we get to the nervous system. And they are these, these meninges are what are responsible for uh, surrounding and protecting the brain and the spinal cord. All right. Uh, however, in the ventral body cavity, this red area, uh, they are, as we already talked about, surrounded by a serous membrane. Or, again, serous is the adjective, the noun would be serosa. And there's two important things that we need to know about these serosas. Uh, the first is that uh, what they do. Any idea what a serous membrane does? Is it lubricates? Yeah, how does it lubricate? What does it produce? Like a mucus? Close, not quite a mucus, but guess what a serous membrane produces? How about serous fluid? It makes it convenient. Serous fluid is a watery uh, uh, substance, but you are absolutely correct. The reason for it is to reduce friction. Again, think of it this way. You put your hands together and you rub them. What starts to happen? Heat. Yeah, they get hot. However, if you spit on them first, and then rubbed them together, it would be a while before they started to get hot because uh, uh, saliva has a serious component to it. Now, saliva also has mucus in it as well, which as an older sibling, you of course know, when you kneel on your younger sibling's chest, you can dribble that little bit of spit out till it almost touches their nose and then suck it back up, right? Because it has that mucus quality to it, but it also has that watery component. And that watery component is that serous, which I spelled wrong, uh, that serous fluid. And its job is to reduce friction. And the way it reduces friction, as we saw with the hands, is by having two surfaces that rub against each other. So all of our serous membranes have two layers. They have a parietal layer, and that parietal layer does one of two things. It either forms the cavity, or it lines the cavity. And we have the visceral layer, which is on the outer surface of the organ. So there are two uh, different layers, a parietal and a visceral layer, to all serous membranes. The other important thing to remember is while there are two layers, parietal and visceral, this is a double membrane and they're actually connected to each other. 
So these two layers are actually connected to each other. Again, I can do it here in words, but I think it makes much more sense when we look at it visually. The example I always like to use in the classroom is the example that we have here on the right. On the right here, what we have is a partially filled balloon. And if you took a partially filled balloon and shoved your fist into that balloon, what would happen is some of the balloon would wrap around the surface of your hand. But because the balloon contains air, the whole balloon wouldn't collapse down on your hand. Instead, there would be an outer portion here that would basically form the cavity. And so as we can see in this simple analogy, we can see the three components. We can see the visceral layer, whoops, wrong direction. The visceral layer that is in direct contact with the hand. The parietal layer, which is forming the cavity, informing the, yeah, form the cavity and the actual cavity itself. And in this case with the balloon, that cavity contains air. Now, there's one other important thing to think about as well. If we were to take a small piece of the balloon, like this piece right here, and cut it out and look at it under a microscope, and I were to take this piece right here and cut it out and look at it under the microscope, would they be the same or would they be different? What do you think? Is this part of the balloon the same as that part of the balloon, or do they think they're different somehow? They're different. Well, which one is it? Are they the same or different? Think about it. If I have that balloon, if, if instead I pushed my hand in from this side, this part of the balloon would wrap around my hand, and that part would form the cavity. So is there really a difference between these two parts? No. 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 The only difference... is their location. That is the only difference between those two pieces of the balloon. One part of that balloon is touching the hand and one part of the balloon is not. And that's the only difference. However, it's a really important difference. And so one of the things that we will see in this class is we are gonna name things based on their locations. All right. Here's a pencil. Is this the only one in the world? No, no, of course not. There are gajillions of them. However, this one happens to be in my cup. This one happens to have my teeth marks on it. And this one happens to be here at my house. So based on its location only, this is Daniel Slutsky's pencil. We can give it a name based on its location. One of you held up a pencil that pencil would be the exact same. It would have whatever the fake lead is on the inside of these things now, and an eraser on the end, and the wood on it, and it would be all, all the things, all the properties of it would be the same. The only difference would be its location. And so when we talk about things, we give them names based on their location. And we've already talked about that. Notice right here, visceral is the name we give a serous membrane based on its location of being on the organ. And parietal is the name we give the serous membrane based on the fact that it lines or forms the cavity. So notice we've already started talking about and using terms to identify these things based on their location. The same way this part of the balloon is exactly the same as that part of the balloon. It turns out this part of the serous membrane is exactly the same as this part of the serous membrane. The only difference is their location. And because this one's on the organ, we call it visceral. And this one's lining the cavity or forming the cavity, we call it parietal. But there's another location name here as well. That other location name is pericardium. 
when we talk about serous membranes, there are three main locations. Oops, I spell locations right. Where we find them. So guess how many location names we have. Oh, that's supposed to be a three. There we go. Three main locations where we find serous membranes. So guess how many different locational names we have for serous membranes? Three. Not your question. Three. Three, there you go. One location as we see here is on the heart. So on the heart, the serous membrane associated with the heart, we call a pericardium based on its location. There's a serous membrane that wraps around the lung based on what we saw as the cavity. Guess what? Oh, oops, I spelled pericardium, right? Anyone remember the term we used associated with the lung? Plural. Plural, excellent. Plural, or plurum, I guess we should be consistent. And the third location is the abdominal, abdominal pelvic cavity. And those in the abdominal pelvic cavity we call the peritoneum. So we have three different serous membranes in three different locations. And again, anatomically, there is no difference between a pericardium, a pleurum, and a peritoneum. The only difference is their location. Let's go back and look at one of the pretty pictures we were looking at before. All right? Here we see a thoracic cavity in a frontal or coronal section, and we can see these pleural cavities, two of them, one on the right, one on the left, where the pleura is located. Remember, the mediastinum doesn't have a serous membrane in it, but inside the mediastinum, we have the pericardium for the heart, and then the abdominal pelvic cavity as well. Now, let's go back to this picture that we were looking at before, and now we can precisely see six different identifiable serous membranes. So on the test, if I had an arrow that pointed right here, and I asked you to identify that specific membrane, how would you identify that specific membrane? Right. Plural. Right. Plural. Plural. Cavity. Nope, the membrane. The plural. Oops, I uh, We're missing one part of it. Uh, Parietal. There you go. Okay. Right. Parietal pleural membrane. Oh, right. It is lining the cavity. It is associated with the lung and associated with the right lung. Remember, right and left are different. So this would be the right pleural membrane. If instead I move the arrow here, what membrane would that be? Right pleural cavity. Yeah, right. Plural, but what'd we miss? Visceral? Yeah, that would be the right visceral pleural membrane. Oops. What if instead the arrow was here? What would that be? Well, is it on an organ or is it forming a cavity? The parietal pericardium membrane. There you go. Parietal pericardium, because it's associated with the heart. Whereas if instead I put it here, what would that be? Visceral pericardium. Visceral pericardium. And then over here. Yeah. 
Left visceral pleural membrane. It left visceral pleura. And then right here. Right parietal pleural right, membrane. Parietal pleural membrane. Excellent. Notice, again, anatomically, there is no difference in any of these six membranes. The only difference is their location. Yeah, well, I had a question about that. So they're, they're made of all these boundaries for the, the cavities are made of the same tissues? Yep. We, hmm. As we'll talk about next week, as it turns out, a serious membrane, like all membranes, is going to be made up of an epithelial tissue and a connective tissue. And you're going to actually have to know the names of them. But for right now, today, we just need to be able to identify these membranes. But yes, every single one of these six membranes are made with the exact same tissues and have the exact same organization. The only real difference is their location. And uh, parietal is outside of the cavity or boundary and then this Not outside. So, so notice, think of it this way. Parietal is not touching the organs. That's the, the, one of the keys. Mm -hmm. Another key is it either forms the cavity. Notice like for instance with the pericardial, it's actually forming the cavity. Whereas for the pleural, it is lining the cavity. Notice it's the ribs and the thoracic cavity that makes uh, the ribs and the muscles that make the cavity. So it's lining the cavity. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so parietal either forms the cavity or lines the cavity. And as you guys mentioned, all of these are going to produce <clears throat> here is fluid. Now, is our goal going to be to fill this space with serious fluid, as much serious fluid as we possibly can get in there? No. No. It's just going to have a thin, slippery coat to it so that those two surfaces glide across each other. So we just need a thin surface of serious fluid that is going to allow those organs to move and glide and reduce their friction. Now, remember, this is just in the thoracic cavity. So remember also in the abdominal pelvic cavity, all the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity, are the stomach, the liver, the small intestine, the large intestine, are all surrounded by a serous membrane called the uh, peritoneum. And the one on the surface of the stomach would be visceral. And the one lining the cavity would be parietal. Okay. Questions on those? So know your membranes. And again, the key word, the key way to distinguish these, and again, those magic words that I will use on the exam so that you know to be precise, it's based on location, right? We are giving these things names based on their location. And this is just going to be the first of many times that we give things names based on their location. All righty. Now, this helps to separate the organs and helps to hold the structures in place. But it is equally important to keep water where we want it to be. Right? Us here in Sacramento probably know this better than most, although it's been a while and fewer and fewer people remember it but uh, we are big, huge bags of water. About 60% of your body weight is water. And where that water goes is super important. If let's say, not so hypothetically, you were to drink a massive amount of water in a very short period of time to, I don't know, let's say, win a now completely outdated video game system, could that large ingestion of water disrupt the movement of water in the body and where that body's located, leading yeah. to cellular damage, leading to organ failure, leading to death? Yes. Yeah, absolutely, right? Not Did you leave for a week. week, right? That happened here in Sacramento many years ago, right? And so being able to maintain water where it needs to be and having it flowing in the right place is vitally important. So again, we have about 40 liters of water. It makes up about 60% of our body weight. Notice uh, two thirds of that is uh, intracellular, right? That means that it is inside of the cells. Oops. And uh, about a third of it 
uh, making up about 20% of your body weight is outside of the cells. And that basically occurs in two places. The interstitial fluid is, uh, surrounds the cell, so it's outside cell, but in the tissues, This is where we exchange resources with the cells and the cells get rid of their waste and get their nutrients and things like that. And then of course, 20% uh, of it, uh, that is in our blood plasma, right? So this is basically in our blood and it's used for transportation. And then obviously moving these things back and forth between these two allow us to control what's going on in the cell. So the other thing we have to not worry about just the structures, we also have to talk about uh, body weight and body water and where that water is moving and how that water is moving. One of the things you got to remember is water is where all the chemical reactions in the body take place. In an anatomy and physiology class, one of the things we very rarely say is always or never. Because one of the things we'll learn is there's going to be exceptions up the wazoo. But so far, every single chemical reaction that has ever been discovered and described in the body takes place in water. So having that water inside the cell and outside the cell and controlling its movement in and outside of the cell, as we're going to learn, is going to be vitally important for maintaining our homeostasis and our well-being. All right. Questions on that? All right. Excellent. That is actually what I wanted to do for our quote unquote lecture part of class. Uh, so again, whoops. Well, no, what did I just do? Sorry. Um, we talked about that. We did that. Excellent. For our quote unquote lab, and there's not going to be a tremendous amount of it today, uh, but what I want to do is I want to do a quick review. One of the things we talked about when we were talking about our hierarchies is our 11 organ systems. And I did see some of you guys counting them out. So what I would like to do as a group now is to think about and identify all 11 of our organ systems. Once we do that, uh, we need to know uh, general functions of these systems and we need to know uh, at least a couple of the uh, specific organs. One of the important things to remember is the goal isn't to master this material, right? When you get to the digestive system, for instance, you will learn that the large intestine has six different regions to it. And you'll need to know things like the cecum and the ascending colon and the sigmoid colon and things along those lines. We don't have to be there yet, but at this class, at this level, do we need to know what the large intestine is and which organ system it is a part of? Absolutely. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's uh, go ahead and cheat. And, oops, no, that didn't work. Wipe that out. So what I need you guys to do for me now is to give me one of the names of one of our 11 organ systems down in the body. Circulatory. Circulatory, all right. I heard circulatory. What else? Respiratory. Tory. I heard respiratory. Hold on. Someone's ch uh, chatting. What was that one? Oops. Where's my chat window? Oh, I made it big. Uh, reproductive. Excellent. Digestive. Productive. Digestive. Nervous system. And nervous. Endocrine. Endocrine. Skeletal. Skeletal, uh, muscular, lymphatic, pigmentary. I heard, oops, I spelled that horribly. You get the idea. You're uh, I heard, uh, there you go. I heard the other two, lymphatic. And then I think someone just said urinary. Excellent. I think that's everything. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Perfect. Excellent. There you go. Those are 11 organ systems, excellent. So we have identified them. Uh, that is a good starting point. Let's talk about functions then. Uh, let's talk about functions of the cardiovascular system. Let's start there. What's the function of the cardiovascular system? To transport oxygen throughout the body to the muscles. Excellent. Transportation is a perfect answer. Uh, oxygen is definitely one of the things, but is that the only thing that needs to be transported by the circulatory system? 
potassium. Yeah, carbon dioxide, other wastes, what else? Nutrients throughout the body. Nutrients, there you go. What else? I can think of at least three more good things. Water. Water, there you go. Remember we talked about the importance of water. Water is definitely an excellent one. What else? For oxygen. We said the oxygen was said already. Absolutely, oxygen is one of them. What would blood be with oxygen? Oh, well, blood is the medium. It is the substance that does the transportation in the cardiovascular system, bringing the water. Uh, what else does blood bring with it? White blood cells. There you go. That was one of the ones I was looking for. Hormones. Hormones is definitely one of them. The chemical signals of your body, medications and things like that that you take get transported that way. Uh, what else? There's one more big one that you guys aren't thinking about. Metabolic waste. True, metabolic waste, uh, sugars and other nutrients are definitely things. Uh, some of those have been mentioned, but all right, think of it this way. Let's say, theoretically, uh, that you have to give a presentation. And so you got your camera on, you're standing up in front of it. And while you're doing that, your pants suddenly fall down, right? Is there gonna be a change in blood flow? I don't know, maybe to the surface of your skin, like your face? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and while it gets really red, what else do you notice when you get embarrassed like that? Get hot. You get hot. Heat. Heat is another one of those important things. Maybe instead, during the next break, you decide to run around your bedroom 15 times. Right? When you come back, not only will we be able to see that you're red in the face, but if any of us were allowed to get close enough, we wouldn't have to even touch you, but we could feel the heat radiating off of your skin from those blood vessels that dilate. So absolutely. Our blood uh, transports massive amounts of different types of things through our body. Excellent. All right. And again, not only do we need to identify our organ systems, know some of their basic functions, but we need to identify the organs in it as well. What are some of the organs in the cardiovascular system? Heart. 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 What else? Arteries, veins. Yeah, blood vessels, arteries, okay. veins, capillaries, things like that. Perfect. All right. Respiratory system. What's the function of the respiratory system? Exchange gases. There you go. Gases is the key term there. Because what gases are we talking about? Oxygen, carbon monoxide. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, absolutely. Those are the two main gases we were talking about. People always, always remember oxygen, right? When we talked about circulatory system, transporting oxygen was vitally important. But as we'll learn, Carbon dioxide is actually more important for many of our physiological processes. Right? What do you do when you don't get your way? Okay, maybe you don't do it anymore, but when you were a little kid, what did you do when you didn't get your way? Ow. Hold your breath, right? I don't want to go to school. And your wife goes, tough, you have to teach today, get out of here, right? You hold your breath. Can you hold your breath forever? No. No, eventually you have to breathe. Because you're not oxygen? Yeah. The reason you breathe isn't that you run out of oxygen. The reason that you breathe is you build up too much CO2. So CO2 actually plays a much more important role in regulating your breathing rate than oxygen does. Excellent. What are some of the organs in the respiratory system? Lungs. <laughs> the lungs. What else? Larynx. Nose. I like that. Bronchi. Larynx. Good. What else? Diaphragm. Mouth? Diaphragm? Is your diaphragm? Excellent. Is your mouth part of the respiratory system? Yes. I heard a yes and I heard a no. Which one's correct? I would say so. Yes. Well, okay, think of it this way. Anybody who's ever had a cold was able to survive that cold because they were able to get air in through their, their mouth because their nose was congested. Uh -huh. However, by the same token, I can put a straw in my nose and I can actually inhale milk through that straw in my nose and get it into my stomach. So if I can get milk into my stomach through my nose, does that make my nose part of the digestive system? No. No. It is a path that we can use, but it's not actually part. And the same thing is true for the mouth. The mouth is not actually part of the respiratory system. Yes, like I said, if you've ever had a cold, you survived it because you could get air in through your mouth but it's not specialized the same way your nose is. So technically it is not considered a part of the respiratory system. All right, reproductive. What's the function of the reproductive system? Reproduce. Yes, reproduce, yes. The building is tall because it is tall. 
Don't, let's use a different word than the actual word itself to define it. What does it mean to reproduce? Uniting gametes. There you go. Oh, I like that. Uniting gametes. There you go. Right? And you unite gametes to make babies. Right? Produce offspring. Absolutely. What is the... Uh, so again, we want to uh, mature sexually. We want to be able to produce offspring. That is the function of the reproductive, or, uh, the reproductive system. What are the primary organs of the reproductive system? Okay. Ovaries, testes. There you go. Absolutely. Again, I, know, I always love the quiet when I first asked that question because everybody's nervous about saying penis and vagina. <laughs> This is an anatomy and physiology class. You are actually allowed to say penis and vagina. However, as was pointed out, those aren't the right answers. Uh, the penis and vagina are important copulatory organs, but the primary organs of the reproductive system are what we collectively refer to as the gonads, and those are the ovaries and the testes, right? They make the gametes, they make the, or as we explained it to my daughter when she was young, the puzzle pieces, right? Mom and dad had puzzle pieces. They put those puzzle pieces together to make her, right? And so again, those are the primary organs. But yes, the penis and the vagina are also important uh, reproductive organs, the mammary glands, the uterus, things along those lines as well. Uh, yes, Ryan. Um, I'm curious, is, so the cardiovascular system, is that a combination of circulatory and respiratory or? No, cardio, not, so cardiovascular. That's just circulatory. Would just be another way of saying circulatory cardiovascular system yeah because again circulatory i guess just involves the, the blood vessels cardiovascular would probably be more accurate because it includes the heart as well but yeah i would accept both of those for uh, for terms for that all right i misspelled it but what's the function of the digestive system and again we don't want to say to digest break down the food break down the sugars and Discrete ways break down food absorb nutrients. So. Excellent. Break down food and uh, bring it into the body. All right. That's an important distinction to make about the digestive system. The digestive system is a really interesting organ system. If you think about it, its job, or it is, let's say it that way, the digestive system is a big, huge, hollow tube. Right? that goes all the way from your mouth to your anus. In a cadaver, that hollow tube is about 30 feet long. Oh, God. Now, notice I said in a cadaver. Why did I say in a cadaver? Don't you all have digestive systems? Yeah. Yeah. Is your digestive system 30 feet long? Very size. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It, well, part of it that it varies by the size of the individual. That's certainly true. But there's another thing as well. Everybody's in here is much shorter than 30 feet long right now. And why would that be the case? Why are you not 30 feet long? Well, death is many things, but one of the things death is, is relaxing. When we die, our muscles relax. Our digestive system has a tremendous amount of muscle, and that muscle has muscle tone. That muscle tone helps to keep the food moving through it, keep tension on the food that's moving through it, and, and so it makes it much, much shorter. When we die, all that muscle relaxes and it expands out. Peristalsis stuff. Yeah, peristalsis is one of the processes, absolutely. Now, one of the important things to remember about digestive system is its job is to break down the food and to bring it into the body. Right, let's grab that pencil again. If I have that pencil and I lay it on the surface of my arm, is it suddenly inside my body? No. No, if I want to get into my body, I have to pass <laughs> through a membrane, right? I'd have to pass through a membrane to get it in. It's the same thing, let's grab something smaller. A paper clip. If I take this paper clip, I put it in my hand and I wrap my hand around it, is that paper clip inside of my body? No. No, it may be surrounded by my body, but it's not inside the body. If I hold it in my mouth, is it inside the body? Yes. No, again, oh. it's surrounded by my body, but it's not uh. inside my body. And what if I swallowed it? 
And again, you shouldn't yes. swallow paper clips, but let's think of this way. Little kids swallow pennies all the time. That penny enters into their mouth. And when it enters into their mouth and they swallow it, is it inside the body? No. It's not. As it turns out, the lumen, and lumen is the fancy name for the space inside of a hollow organ. The lumen of our digestive system is actually outside the body. They have a fancy name for this. The fancy name for this is they say it is the topological exterior. So if you think about it, that penny that that little kid swallows enters in, and what happens to that penny? Passes through. It passes right on through, comes out a couple days later, a little dirtier or a little cleaner, depending <laughs> on how you think of it. And at that point, it's never entered the body. It passed through the body, but it hasn't entered into the body. Instead, let's talk about that cheeseburger you had for breakfast. There's the bottom bun. Cheeseburger for breakfast? Yeah, cheeseburger is the best thing to have for breakfast. There's the patty. Uh, I'm going to have to cheat and draw the bun top. There you go. Put some sesame seeds on there. Yeah, that cheeseburger for breakfast. Your digestive system breaks that down. And once it breaks it down, it then moves those nutrients across the membrane and brings it into our body. Right? Mm -hmm. Your body had no use of currency. There are no penny receptors inside your body. So that penny entered and left without actually entering the body. To get into the body, the same way I have to stab myself with that pencil to get inside my body, our nutrients, once broken down, have to pass a membrane. So one of the unique things about our digestive system is if you think of all of our glands, like our salivary glands or our stomach glands, they are all secreting stuff outside of the body into the lumen of our digestive system to break down that food so we can bring it inside. That's key. Not only are we breaking down food, but we're breaking down that food. So we can bring it inside our, mem our body. We can cross a membrane, and that's really the key. Uh, do you can cross that membrane to get into the body. That uh, the digestive system could take like trace amounts of the metal from the penny out and put it in the body. The body uses metals, right? Uh, yeah, as it, it can be a micronutrient. I mean, I'm not suggesting you swallow a penny as <laughs> getting the you know the micronutrients that are necessary, uh, like curious. iron and things like that. But is it possible that uh, that yes, yeah, some of it could could come off of that, or some of the dirt off of it can come off of it, or things like that? Sure, the acid could potentially, and your stomach could potentially etch it, or something along those lines. So it'd be possible. Yeah, possibly. Again, for it enough to be damaging, you'd probably have to eat a whole lot of pennies, and that yeah. leads to a whole other problem in and of itself. So there are probably better ways to get that. All righty. So, and then, of course, organs in the digestive system, as we talked about, again, not the nose, but mouth, all the things that make up that hollow tube, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, so and so Esophagus. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Questions on that one? All right, let's talk about nervous system. What is the function of our nervous system? Support signals. Excellent. Signals to do what? Everything. To keep us alive from getting hurt? True, absolutely. I like that. And so all of those things are absolutely true. So let's condense that down to a simple term. Our nervous system is specialized for communication. All right. And again, how does it communicate? Anybody know the fancy term? Electrical signal propagation. Absolutely, it is an electrical signal. It uses an electrical signal to communicate. Anybody know the fancy name for that electrical signal? A neuron. neuron. Neuron's what makes it, but what it makes is called an action potential. It's okay if you don't know that. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Excellent. Electrical signals, these are fast, rapid uh, signals that communicate and allow us to respond to our environment. Like you guys said, help us to maintain our body temperature. If we touch something hot, we're able to pull away from it. It allows for rapid, quick communication, all right? 
what are some of the organs of the nervous system? Brain. Brain's the big one. What else? Spinal cord. Spinal cord, nerves, things along those lines, ganglion. Absolutely. There's another organ system on here that's specialized for communication as well. What is that one? Endocrine. Endocrine. Excellent. The endocrine is also specialized for communication. More chemical communication. Right? There you go. But it uses a chemical signal. And that chemical signal has a special name as well. What's the special name for the chemical signal that our endocrine system uses? Hormones. Hormones. Excellent. Hormones are a much slower, longer lasting chemical signal. Right? Think about it. If I put my hand on something hot, you wouldn't want my hand to have to produce a chemical signal, release that chemical signal into the blood, got circulated to the blood till it finally got to my brain, where my brain received that signal. Then my brain was able to make its own chemical signal, release it into the blood, let it go through our circulation to go back to my hand to tell my hand to move away. By the time all that happened, my hand would be burned off. So having that electrical signal of the nervous system have me pull my hand away is much, much faster. However, these chemical signals are much longer lasting. So they allow us to coordinate activity for a much longer period of time, right? As you sit here in the classroom right now, quietly sitting in your room or like as you're going to be doing, it's three in the morning and you're studying for this class before an exam and everything's quiet and suddenly bang, there's a loud noise outside, right? You hear a car backfire. That's going to scare the bejesus out of and you are going to jump as a response to it. But then, boom, you realize that it is just a car backfiring. You know you're safe. Everything is okay. But does your heart rate instantly go back to normal again? No. No, because what happens is a part of that neural response is the release of adrenaline, that chemical signal that keeps you in that elevated state for a prolonged period of time. Yeah. So again, so both of these are specialized for communication, but they communicate at a very different pace and in a very different level. Now, give me some examples of some endocrine glands. Because that's the other thing. These things that produce hormones are all glands. Thyroid. I'm sorry, say it again. Thyroid. The thyroid gland, absolutely. Thyroid, uh, the thyroid gland. What else? The adrenaline gland. gland. Yeah, adrenal gland, absolutely. We just talked about that. Or super renal, it sits on top of the kidneys. Give me one more. Gallbladder is one, right? No, no. no. Gallbladder is part of the digestive system. What's the big one? What 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 gland makes the most hormones? Anybody know? Testosterone and estrogen. Oh, great, great example. Gonads. The gonads are also endocrine glands. Many of these organs are found in multiple systems. So the, the gonads are part of the reproductive system and also part of the endocrine system. Although that wasn't actually the one I was thinking of. What's the other one that produces actually what? Anyone know the gland that produces the most? Hypothalamus? Yes. Close. Not the hypothalamus, but the pituitary gland. Pituitary. There you go. Oh, excellent. What? That's fine. Excellent, excellent. In fact, the pituitary, the pituitary gland is known as the master endocrine gland because it produces, not only does it produce over a dozen hormones, but many of its hormones are things like thyroid stimulating hormone. Guess what thyroid stimulating hormone does? Stimulates the thyroid. Stimulates the thyroid, there you go, exactly. So the pituitary gland, many of the pituitary glands hormones stimulate other organs. All right, excellent. What is the function of the skeletal system? Okay. Structural integrity. Excellent. I like that. Structure and integrity. I like that. Oops. Why is that not typing? Structure. Absolutely. Oops, I spell it right, but you get the idea. What else? Support. I like support. One other. What's the big three? Structure, support, and? Like protection. Protection. Excellent, right? Your skull bones we talked about plays an important role in protecting your brain. However, how many bones do I have in my hand? Exactly, a lot, absolutely. Now eventually <laughs> we'll have to count them, but a lot works for now. Are any of them providing protection? No, uh, no. But, but they're giving structure and they're allowing movement, right? That's the other thing. 
These are the level, the, the levers that allow that movement to occur. So provide structure. I've made a mess of the board here, so I'll show it to you guys in a little bit later. Uh, but when we talk about the importance of the skeletal system, we'll save that for the end. <coughs> of course, if this is an organ system, there must be organs. Are there organs in the skeletal system? Yes. Uh, bones, absolutely. And how many bones do we have? 206, 207. Well, we'll go with that for now. 206 named bones. We'll qualify it that way. Uh, as we'll learn, you actually have far more than that, but 206 named bones. And guess how many of those you're going to have to learn? All, of them. All 206, absolutely. Excellent. All right. Now, as I said, part of that allowing the movement goes right with our muscular system. The muscular system is what is responsible for movement, both internal and external. All right. If I stand here and I put my arms out and I hold my breath, right, there may not be any external movement going on, but there's plenty of internal movement. My heart is beating. My uh, digestive system is breaking down that cheeseburger I had for breakfast. All that other internal movement is going on. So we have all that muscular uh, uh, system that does all of that, that muscular tissue that does all of that. And of course, with our muscular system, we have muscles. How many named muscles do we have? Anyone know? Is it less than bones? Oh, Jesus. 600 named muscles in the body. And guess how many of those you have to learn? Do you have to learn all 600? No, you don't have to, no, don't worry, you don't have to learn all 600, only yeah. about 545. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. It'll be much less. Than that. It'll be, it'll be that it's not going to be that bad. You'll only have to learn a small fraction of those. All right. What is the function of the integumentary system, aside being spelled properly? Protection. Regulate body temperature. Excellent. So it plays a role in body temperature, plays a role in that. What else? This is skin, right? Yeah. Oh, there's a the magic word I was looking for. Protection. Yeah, integumentary system is a fancy word for skin. Absolutely. It provides body temperature, provides some other things, but one of the big things it does is it provides protection, right? Help to limit our world and separate our world from the outside world, providing some protection. Uh, protection from UV radiation, protection from chemical and physical uh, abuse, uh, uh, protection from water loss and water gain. Absolutely a lot of things. And of course, what is the main organ of the integrity system? Skin. Skin, there you go, exactly. And then of course the nails and the glands and the hairs and things along those lines as well. What about the lymphatic system? What's our function here? Uh, immune response. Excellent. And I love the way you said that. You do not, okay, this is where, again, I'm sitting, so it doesn't, it's not quite as effective, but here's where I usually get on my soapbox. You do not have an immune system. Notice you have 11 organ systems, mm -hmm. and immune is not one of them. Uh, organ systems are comprised of many organs that work together. Your immune response is a series of cells and chemicals that work together physiologically to help to protect your body. And many of those cells and chemicals are housed in our lymphatic system. So yes, your lymphatic system plays an important role in your immune response, All right? Does it do anything else? It's also involved in transportation, specifically a fluid. One of the things that we will learn is our cardiovascular system is leaky. Fluid is constantly leaking out of it. And so what our lymphatic system does is it takes that fluid and brings it back and drops it back into the cardiovascular system so that our cardiovascular system, our blood volume stays constant. 
Does it like process metabolites? Right, and it's gonna process it on the way. That's the beauty of it. It doesn't just take it and blindly dump it back in. It inspects mm -hmm. it. And that's where it's looking for harmful pathogens or it's looking for abnormal cells or it's looking for other things along those ways as well. Again, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but maybe you know someone who had cancer of some sort. And often when that cancer gets into the lymphatic system, that can become very problematic, right? Because it can affect how rapidly it can go through the system. So maybe one of the things that happens is they get those uh, lymph nodes in their armpit removed. And then one of the problems they have for a few months is that their hand swells, right? It makes it harder to get that ring off when you get to the bar on Friday night and things along those lines, right? So it plays that important role in transportation of fluid and also your immune response. And what are the main organs of the lymphatic system? You have lymphatic vessels and what's the other thing? Lymph nodes. Lymph nodes, there you go, absolutely. Anything else? Tonsils. Tonsils, there you go, spleen your appendix, all of these are things in the lymphatic system. And then last, probably the worst name of all of the organ systems, the urinary system. Is the function of the urinary system to produce urine? It's to filter. It wants to eliminate toxins. There you go. The goal of it is really to filter the blood. That filtering of the blood is a vitally important process. It filters that blood. And again, the waste is then removed from the body in the form of urine. But the goal isn't to make urine, the goal is to filter the blood. And of course, what are the primary organs involved in that? Kidney, bladder. There you go. Well, kidneys are really, those, the kidneys are the workhorses. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things we'll learn in this class is life is lazy. Once it figures out a process of doing things, it does it pretty much. It'll reuse that process again and again and again. One of the other things we use is the goal is not to maximize the efficiency, to just be good enough, right? Lungs are a perfect example. You have two lungs. If you lost one of your lungs, would you die? No. No, you would be able to live with one lung. Would you necessarily be able to be a professional athlete? No. No, it would affect your ability to function. You have two eyes. If you lost an eye, would you die? No. Would you necessarily be able to be a professional athlete, especially like maybe a wide receiver trying to catch a ball with one eye? <laughs> Depth perception might be an issue at that point. But what about kidneys? If you, you got two kidneys, if you lost a kidney, would you die? No, you wouldn't die. Would you be able to be a professional athlete? Maybe. Yeah. In fact, one kidney can do all of the filtering necessary of your blood. We, with our two kidneys, we actually have a tremendous redundancy. Mm. Again, you may not have thought of it in those terms because you're aware of it, because there are plenty of people who donate kidneys. There are plenty of people who sell them on eBay or get them stolen when they're you know, overseas or whatever it is, right? And with one kidney, you could be a professional athlete. You might not necessarily want to be one because if you injured that second one, what happens then? If you have yeah, no just... kidneys, yeah, well, but even dialysis, is that really a long-term solution? No. no it is a so short-term stopgap. If you don't have kidneys, you are not going to survive for very long. So that filtering of the blood is vitally important. While you're sitting here calmly in your chair, 25% of your blood is passing through your kidneys every minute. 25%? Yeah, a large amount, absolutely. No, 25%. 25. Wow. Oh. In fact, you're constantly filtering your blood you're producing 200 liters of filtrate during the course of the day. Do you produce 200 liters of urine? No. No, we'd all be sitting in the bathroom if that was the case right now, <laughs> absolutely, right? But, uh, so most of that filtrate is reabsorbed and we only produce about one to two liters of urine. And it's all done by the kidneys. The ureter, the bladder, the urethra, they're really just about storing that urine till you get to a socially appropriate location where you can then void it. All right, questions on that? So there you go. We've identified all 11 organ systems, their main functions. We've identified some of the organs of that. Your book's got a nice table uh, that we will talk about. I promised you a fun picture. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean the 80s, uh, there was a comic book artist by the name of, or a comic book series, I should say, by the name of The Far Side. 
And this is my favorite far side uh, commercial. It is a boneless chicken ranch, All right? As you can see again, without those skeletal systems, there is no structure, there is no support for the chickens. So they are just draped over the things along those lines as well. All right, as I mentioned, your book's got a nice figure that talks about all the organs and organ systems. Like I said, you're not responsible for the parts. You don't need to know all the parts of the large intestine. You don't need to know all the parts of the small intestine. You just need to know large intestine and small intestine. You need to know your 11 organ systems. You need to know the organs and in general where they're located in the body uh, and um, uh, know their general functions. Uh, normally on the second day of class, we do a rat dissection, which is a great overview of the organs and organ systems. There's a tremendous amount of similarity between the organization in the rat as opposed to ours. Obviously that isn't something we are capable of doing, but if you look at your PAL CD, on your PAL, oh, not CD, but that PAL program that is in the person, you know, that, uh, that uh, professional anatomy lab that is in your modified mastering A and P, there is a uh, cat dissection that you can look at. So it's a great way of getting an organ system overview in the cat. And also they've got the human cadaver as well. So I encourage you to look at those and familiarize yourself with where these things are in the body. All right, questions on any of that? Yeah, what was the name again uh, where we look, where we find that? So under your study tools in the, in the Master in A&P, there is a professional anatomy lab. And that is what you're going to want to look at for that. All righty. Well, so with that, that is everything that I wanted to cover for today. I think I've got everything. Uh, there are a couple people that, again, still need to talk to me. Some have been texting. Uh, through the private chat. Uh, so you need to see that. Also, uh, many of you still need to do your five for five. So what will happen is I'm going to end this and close this window uh, because that lets the, uh, the video start to um, compile. It takes the video time to compile. Uh, what I will be doing is then opening up my uh, personal Zoom office uh, through Zoom. So again, that's that 916-484-8992, uh, which is also my work number. Uh, so for those of you who have not had the opportunity, uh, I will have that open. Again, I will have the weight room open because I'm going to let students in one at a time. So if, if uh, again, there's, I'm guessing a lot of people who still need to do this, so you may be waiting for a while. I'll be available for at least the next hour or so. And then if that doesn't work for you, uh, contact me and we can find a different time uh, to do this. But again, to get your five points of extra credit, this needs to be done by tomorrow. And don't wait to do it tomorrow morning. I don't wake up too much earlier than we need to do to roll onto here to get onto class. All right. Questions on anything we've talked about or anything we've covered today? Yeah, just one question. Uh, you said the people that were on the waiting list, the names that you uh, posted, yes. I believe the seven names, you want us just to email you and say, hey, we're on the list or what? Yes, absolutely. So here's what's going to happen. So again, so for these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these seven individuals, uh, email, send me an email, uh, and I will send you your uh, the instructions and your uh, your uh, ad number. There's a specific ad number that's specific for you, so you can sell it on eBay or anything like that. Uh, and again, make sure you use it today. Because uh, again, if you use it today, you show up on the computer tomorrow. If you're not in, officially enrolled in the class tomorrow, uh, you will lose your priority to add, and I will add somebody else. Okay? And then also remember when you sign up, make sure you pay as well. I don't remember what it is, you got 48 hours or 72 hours or whatever it is. If you get dropped for non payment, you lose your priority as well. So make sure you pay for that as well. All right? Okay. Excellent. So again, if you're one of these people, you need to talk to me, come to my office hours. If you're one of these people, send me an email. You don't have to come and talk to me. Send me an email and I will send you the ad slip. Of course, if you have questions and haven't done your five for five, then you can come and do that as well. All right. Any other questions? All right, guys. Good first day. Look at that. We're finishing 30 minutes early. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> I, will, I will see you guys tomorrow. Uh, and... Uh, that's pretty well. And then, oh, remember, tomorrow we will have, uh, you have a ton of stuff to do. Make sure you get all your activities done. And then remember the chemistry quiz opens this afternoon. That's new. Make sure you get that. And there will also be an attendance quiz at the beginning of class tomorrow to make sure that everybody's still here. So hopefully you'll still be here and I will see you tomorrow morning. All right, guys, be safe. Take care. And I will see you tomorrow.
Thank you. Right. See you. Thank you.